paper with you. You can follow as I'm reading the sutta or you can just listen. And I'm not going to comment much on this as I read it through. We have about two hours to do this. We can do this. And what's happening is you're going to hear the sutta and then you are going to go back through the sutta with the comments on the commentary. Okay, that's how this is happening. So we start, for anyone who doesn't know the story, okay, I will tell you very briefly. Uh, this is Majima Nikaya number 140. It is about the Datu Vibhanga Sutta, the exposition of the elements. It's famous as the story of the potter's shed and what happened in a village potter shed uh, when the, there was a mendicant who was spending the night in the shed and the Buddha came along and asked if he could stay for the night. And the man said, there's a mendicant in the shed. He said, if you ask him and it's okay, uh, you can both stay in the shed. And the, question, the background I need to tell you is who was in the shed first. Now, Pukasati was not just a common man who decided uh, to be a, uh, a mendicant, and it's a little different. He was a prince of a kingdom in the northern part of India, and he was from a place where uh, they had sheep and they had wool, and he had a friend, and his friend was King Pasanadi. He was a king, and Pasanadi was a king. And how this works is uh, they met and were discussing things and separated. When Pasanadi uh, went back, he had a set of golden plates uh, made and uh, sent to Pukasati with a certain amount of the Buddha Dhamma on the plate, carved into the gold plates, like a set of plates to read. And uh, the, the uh, king got so involved in these, he was just reading them again and again. And he sent a gift to Pasanadi. King Pasanadi received lamb's wool. It's very interesting. He's in a hot place, but he received a shawl made out of young lamb's wool. That's very, very soft, like cashmere, you know? And so these two are friends. And uh, this went so far with uh, Pukasati, that one day when his father passed away uh, and he was fully in charge of everything, he had a discussion with the chancellor and said, well, here it is. Here's the kingdom. I'm giving it to you. And he said, uh, and here, here's the, uh, here's the uh, treasury. I'm giving that to you too. I'm leaving. And so we're not in the 1960s. <laughs> But here he goes. He's going to go off and he's going to try to find the Buddha. And he first becomes a mendicant on his own. Uh, the mendicant is the man who is uh, the swarana in India who is traveling around, but he's not a monk, essentially. He's just a wanderer and he became a wanderer. So he wanders to Sawati. He knows the Buddha is there. He's on his way and this is where this happens. Now, on the other side of the story, the Buddha, he sits every morning. We all hear about how the Buddha sits every morning for at least an hour, sometimes two hours, and he sits and sends compassion to the world. The, he's also sitting in this, he's sitting in the level of infinite space. 
and he's sending compassion and he's watching with the third eye that's open. He's watching the world trying to find who is it out there who needs to hear the Dhamma because they're perfectly ready to become an Arahat. And he knows about what's about to happen. And that's all I'm gonna tell you, so now you listen. So he comes there and he gets in the potter shed too. So that's who's in there. It starts out, <coughs> I'm a terrible voice right now. <coughs> I'm from all the medicine. <coughs> Thus I have heard on one occasion the Blessed One was wandering in the Magadan country and eventually arrived at Rajagaha. And there he went to the potter Bhagava and he said to him, if it is not inconvenient for you Bhagava, I will stay one night in your workshop. It is not inconvenient for me, venerable sir, but there is a homeless one who is already staying here. If he agrees, then stay as long as you like, venerable sir. Now, there was a clansman named Pukasati who had gone forth from the home life in the homelessness out of faith in the Blessed One. And on that occasion, he was already staying in that potter's shed. And then the Blessed One, he went to the Venerable Pukasati and he said to him, if it is not uh, inconvenient for you, Bhikkhu, I will stay one night in the workshop. The potter's workshop is large enough, friend. Let the Venerable One stay as long as he likes. And then the Blessed One entered the potter's workshop, prepared a spread of grass at one end and sat down, folding his legs crosswise and setting his body erect and establishing mindfulness in front of him. And then the Blessed One spent most of the night seated in meditation. And Venerable Pukasati also spent most of the night seated in meditation. And then the Blessed One thought to himself, this clansman conducts himself in a way that inspires confidence. Suppose that I were to question him. And so he asked the Venerable Pukasati, uh, under whom have you gone forth, Bhikkhu? Who is your teacher? Whose Dhamma do you profess? <clears throat> Friend, there is the recluse Gotama the son of the Sakyans, who went forth from a Sakyan clan. Now, a good report of that blessed Gotama has been spread far and wide to this effect, and the blessed one is accomplished. He is fully enlightened in the per perfect and true knowledge and conduct. He is sublime. He is a knower of worlds, incomparable leader of persons to be tamed teacher of gods and humans, enlightened and blessed. I have gone forth under that blessed one. That blessed one is my teacher. I profess the Dhamma of that blessed one. Uh, but Bhikkhu, where is that blessed one? Accomplished and fully enlightened, now living. Well, there is a, a city in the southern countries named Sawati. And the Blessed One, accomplished and fully enlightened, is now living there. Uh, but Bhikkhu, have you ever seen the Blessed One before? Uh, would you recognize him if you saw him? No, friend, I, I have never seen the Blessed One before, nor would I recognize him if I saw him. And then the Blessed One thought, hmm, this clansman has gone forth from the home life into homelessness under me. Suppose that I were to teach him the Dhamma. And so the Blessed One addressed the Venerable Pukusati thus, Bhikkhu, I will teach you the Dhamma. Listen, attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, friend, the Venerable Pukusati replied, and the Blessed One said this. Now, this is where the teaching begins. <clears throat> Bhikkhu, this person consists 
of six elements, six bases of contact, and 18 kinds of mental exploration. He has four foundations. The tides of conceiving do not sweep over one who stands upon these foundations. And when the tides of conceiving no longer sweep over him, he is called a sage at peace. One should not neglect wisdom, should preserve truth, should cultivate relinquishment, and should train for peace. This is the summary of the exposition of the six elements. Bhikkhu, the person consists of six elements. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said, there are the earth element, the water element, the fire element, the air element, the space element, and the consciousness element. And so it was with reference to this that it was said, Bhikkhu, this person consists of six elements. Bhikkhu, the person consists of six bases of contact. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said, there are the base of eye contact, the base of ear contact, the base of nose contact, the base of tongue contact, the base of body contact, and the base of mind contact. And so it was with reference to this that it was said, Bhikkhu, this person consists of six contacts. Bhikkhu, the person consists of 18 kinds of mental exploration. And so it was said, and with reference to what was this said, on seeing a form with the eye, one explores a form productive of joy. One productive of, explores a form productive of grief. One explores a form productive of equanimity. On hearing a sound, one explores a sound productive of joy a sound productive of grief and a sound productive of equanimity. On smelling an odor with the nose, one explores an odor productive of grief, productive of, um, I'm sorry, I'm losing this, explores a productive of joy, productive of grief and productive of equanimity. On tasting a flavor with the tongue, one explores a flavor productive of joy, productive of grief, and productive of equanimity. On touching a tangible with the body, one explores a tangible that is productive of joy, productive of grief, or productive of equanimity. On cognizing a mind object with the mind, one explores a mind object productive of joy, explores a mind object productive of grief, explores a mind object productive of equanimity. And so it was with reference to this that it was said, Bhikkhu, this person consists of 18 kinds of mental exploration. Now Bhikkhu, this person has four, I'm gonna tell it this way, practice foundations, because these are the foundations for you practicing. For it's not for the regular four foundations, it's for practice foundations. And so it was said with reference to what was this said, there is the foundation of wisdom, the foundation of truth, the foundation of relinquishment, and the foundation of peace. And so it was with reference to this that it was said, Bhikkhu, this person has four practice foundations. One should not neglect wisdom, should preserve truth, should cultivate relinquishment, and should train for peace. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said, how, monk, does one neglect, not neglect wisdom? 
there are these six elements, the earth element, the water element, the fire element, the air element, the space element, and the consciousness element. What monk is the earth element? The earth element may be either internal or external. What is the internal earth element? Whatever internally belonging to you is solid, solidified and clung to. That is the head hairs, body hairs, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, sinews, bones, bone marrow, kidneys, heart, liver, diaphragm, spleen, lungs, intestines, mesentery, contents of the stomach, feces, or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is solid, solidified, and clung to. This is called the internal earth element. Now both the internal earth element and the external earth element are simply earth elements. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom. Thus, this is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. When one sees it thus in this way, as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the earth element, makes the mind dispassionate towards the earth element. What monk is the water element? The water element may be either internal or external. What is the internal water element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is water, watery and clung to is bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, grease, spittle, snot, oil of the joints, urine, or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is water, is watery and clung to. And this is called the internal water element now both the internal water element and external water element are simply water element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom. Thus, this is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. When one sees it this way, as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the water element and makes the mind dispassionate towards the water element. And what monk is the fire element? The fire element may be seen either internal or external. What is the internal fire element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is fire, fiery, and clung to, that is, that by which one is warmed, ages, and is consumed, and that by which what is eaten, drunk, consumed, and tasted, gets completely digested, or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is fire, fiery, and clung to, this is called the internal fire element. Now, both the internal fire element and the external fire element are simply fire elements. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. When one sees it thus, as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the fire element, makes the mind dispassionate towards the fire element. And what, bhikkhu, is the air element? The air element may be either internal or external. 
what is the internal air, air element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is air or airy and clung to, that is upgoing winds, downgoing winds, winds in the belly and winds in the bowels, winds that course through the limbs, in breath and out breath, or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is air, airy and clung to. This is called the internal air element. Now both the internal air element and the external air element are simply air element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. When one sees it thus as it actually is, with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the air element makes the mind dispassionate towards the air element. And what bhikkhu is the space element? The space element may be either internal or external. What is the internal space element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is space, spatial, and clung to. And that is the holes of the ears the nostrils, the door of the mouth, and that aperture where what is eaten, drunk, consumed, and tasted gets swallowed, and where it collects, and whereby it is excreted from below, or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is space, spatial, and clung to, it is called the internal space element. Now, both the internal space element and the external space element are simply space element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom. Thus, this is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. And when one sees it thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the space element and makes the mind dispassionate towards the space element. And then there remains only consciousness that is purified and bright. And what does one cognize with that consciousness? One cognizes this is pleasant. One cognizes this is painful. One cognizes this is neither painful nor pleasant. Independence on a contact to be felt as pleasant, there arises a pleasant feeling. What one feels, when one feels a pleasant feeling, one understands I feel a pleasant feeling. One understands with the cessation of the same contact to be felt as pleasant, its corresponding feeling, the pleasant feeling that arose in dependence on that contact to be felt as pleasant will cease and subside. In dependence on that contact to be felt as a painful, as painful there arises a painful feeling. And when one feels a painful feeling, one understands, I feel a painful feeling. One understands with the cessation of the same contact to be felt as painful, the corresponding feeling, the painful feeling that arose in dependence on that contact is to be felt as painful, will cease and subside. And in dependence on a contact to be felt as neither painful nor pleasant, there arises a neither painful nor pleasant feeling. And when one feels a neither painful nor pleasant feeling, one understands, I feel a neither painful nor pleasant feeling. And one understands with the cessation of the same contact to be felt as neither painful nor pleasant, it, uh, its corresponding feeling, the neither painful nor pleasant feeling that arose in dependence on the contact to be felt as neither painful or pleasant, it ceases and subsides. 
thick just as from the contact and the friction of two fire sticks, heat is generated and fire is produced. And with the separation and disjunction of the two fire sticks, the corresponding heat ceases and subsides. So too does this happen with pleasant or painful or neither painful nor pleasant feeling. And one understands with the cessation of the same contact to be felt to form that feeling, its correspondence feeling will cease and subside. And then there remains only equanimity, purified and bright, malleable, wieldy, radiant. Suppose monk, a skilled goldsmith, or his apprentice were to prepare a furnace and heat up the crucible and take some gold with tongs and put it into the crucible. From time to time, he would blow on it. From time to time, he would sprinkle water on it. From time to time, he would just look at it. That gold would become refined, well refined, completely refined, faultless, rid of dross, malleable, wieldy, and radiant. And then whatever kind of ornament he wished to make from it, whether a golden chain or earrings or a necklace or a golden garland, it would serve his purpose. So too, monk, then there remains only equanimity in the mind, purified and bright, malleable, wieldy, radiant. He understands if I were to direct this equanimity so purified and bright to the base of infinite space, and to develop my mind accordingly, then this equanimity of mind supported by that base clinging to it would remain for a very long time. If I were to direct this equanimity so purified and bright to the base of infinite consciousness, so purified and bright to develop my mind accordingly, then that infinite consciousness it would remain for a very long time. And if I were to direct the equanimity in another direction, it would also remain and develop for a very long time. And he understands that if I were to direct the equanimity so purified and bright to the base of infinite space and to develop my mind accordingly, this would be conditioned. If I were to direct this equanimity so purified and bright into the base of consciousness, infinite consciousness, the same process would happen. If I were to direct this into the base of nothingness, the same process would happen. And if I were to direct it uh, into uh, nothingness, the same base uh, process would occur and to the base of neither perception or non-perception and develop my mind in that way it would all be conditioned. He does not form any condition or generate any volition tending towards either being or non-being. Since he does not form any condition or generate any volition tending towards either being or non-being, he does not cling to anything in this world does not crave and cling to anything in this world. And thus he does not crave and cling and he is not agitated. And when he is not agitated, his personal, personally attains Nibbana. He understands thus, birth is destroyed, the holy life has been lived, what had to be done has been done and there is no more coming to any state of being. Now, if he feels a pleasant feeling, he understands it is per impermanent. There is no holding on to it. There is no delight in it. And if he feels a painful feeling, he understands it is impermanent. And there is no holding to it. There is no delight in it. 
And if he feels a neither painful nor pleasant feeling, he understands it is impermanent, there is no holding on to it, there is no delight in it. And if he feels a pleasant feeling, he feels it detached. He feels a painful feeling, he feels it detached. If he feels a neither painful nor pleasant feeling, he feels that detached. And when he feels a feeling terminating with the body, he understands, I feel a feeling terminating with the body. And when he feels a feeling terminating with life, he understands, I feel a feeling terminating with life. He understands on the dissolution of the body with the ending of life, all that is felt, not being delighted in it, will become cool right here. Monk, just as an oil lamp, burns in dependence on oil and a wick. And when the oil and the wick are used up, if it does not get any more fuel and it is extinguished from lack of fuel, so too when he feels the feeling terminating with the body and so forth. We say that again, a feeling terminating with life he understands, I feel a feeling terminating with life. And he understands on the dissolution of the body with the ending of life, all that is felt not being delighted in will become cool right there, right now. Therefore, monk, a monk who possessing this wisdom possesses the supreme foundation of wisdom for this monk is the supreme noble wisdom, namely the knowledge of the destruction of all suffering. His deliverance being founded upon truth is unshakable, for that is false monk, which has a deceptive nature and that is true, which has an undeceptive nature, Nibbana. Therefore, a monk possessing this truth possesses the supreme foundation of truth. For this monk is the supreme noble truth, namely Nibbana, which has an undeceptive nature. Formerly, when he was ignorant, he undertook and accepted acquisitions. Now he has abandoned them, and he has cut them off by the root. He has made them like a palm stump and done away with them, and so that they are no longer subject to any future arising. And therefore, a monk possessing this relinquishment, he possesses the supreme foundation of a relinquishment. For this monk is the supreme noble relinquishment, namely the relinquishment of all acquisitions. Formerly when he was ignorant, he experienced covetousness, desire, and lust, but now he has abandoned them and cut them off at the root, made them like a palm stump, done away with them, so that they are no longer subject to future arising. And formerly he was ignorant. He experienced anger, ill will, and hatred. Now he has abandoned them, cut them off at the roof, made them like a palm stump, and done away with them so that they are no longer subject to future arising. Formerly when he was ignorant, he experienced ignorance and delusion. Now he has abandoned them, cut them off at the root, made them like a palm stump, done away with them so that they are no longer subject to future arising. And therefore a monk possessing this kind of peace possesses the supreme foundation of peace. For this monk is the supreme 
noble peace, namely the pacification of lust, hatred, and delusion. And so it was with reference to this that it was said, one should not neglect wisdom, should preserve truth, should cultivate relinquishment, and should strain for peace. The tides of conceiving do not sweep over one who stands upon these foundations. And when the tides of conceiving no longer sweep over him, he is called a sage at peace. And so it was said, and with reference to what was this said, I shall be is conceiving, I shall not be is conceiving, I shall be possessed of form is a conceiving, I shall be formless is a conceiving, I shall be percipient is a conceiving, I shall be non-percipient is a conceiving, I shall be neither percipient nor non-percipient in the conceiving. Conceiving is a disease. Conceiving is a tumor. Conceiving is a dart. By overcoming all the conceivings, the monk, one is called a sage at peace. And the sage at peace is not born, does not age, does not die. He is not shaken, he does not yearn. And there is nothing present in him by which he might be born. Not being born, how could he age? Not aging, how could he die? Not dying, how could he be shaken? Not being shaken, how should he yearn? And so it was with reference to this that it was said the tides of conceiving do not sweep over one who stands upon these foundations. And when the tides of conceiving no longer sweep over him, he is called a sage at peace. Monk, bear in mind this brief exposition of these six elements. And thereupon, Pupusati thought to himself, indeed, the teacher has come to me. The sublime one has come to me. The fully enlightened one has come here to me. And then he rose from his seat, arranged his upper robe over his shoulder and prostrating himself with his head at the blessed one's feet, he said, venerable sir, a transgression overcame me in that like a fool, confused and blundering, I presumed to address you as friend. Venerable sir, may the blessed one forgive my transgression and to see it as such for the sake of restraint in the future. Surely, Bhikkhu, a transgression overcame you in that like a fool, confused and blundering, you presumed to address me as friend. But since you see your transgression as such and you make amends in accordance with the Dhamma, we forgive you for it is a growth in the noble one's discipline when one sees one's transgression as such, makes amends in accordance with the Dhamma and undertakes restraint in the future. Venerable sir, I would receive the full admission under you, the blessed one. But are your bowl and robes completed, monk? Venerable sir, my bowl and robes are not complete. Bhikkhu Tathagatas, do not give the full admission to anyone whose bowl and robes are not complete. And then the venerable Pukasati Having delighted and rejoiced in the Blessed One's words, he rose from his seat, and after paying homage to the Blessed One, keeping him on his right, he departed in order to search for a bowl and robes. And then while the Venerable Pukasati was searching for his bowl and robes, 
a stray cow killed him. At that point, we all break down and cry when we're listening to this. I can't believe this. You know, nobody could believe it. The first time I heard it, I was just tears running down my face. Oh my goodness. Then a number of monks, they went to the blessed one and after paying homage to him, they sat down on one side and they told him, Venerable Sir, the clansman Pukasati, who was given brief instruction by the blessed one has died. What is his destination? What is his future course? Monks, the clansman Pukasati was wise. He practiced in accordance with the Dhamma and he did not trouble me in the interpretation of the Dhamma. And with the destruction of the five lower fetters, the clansman Pukasati has reappeared spontaneously in the pure abodes and will attain final Nibbana there without ever returning from that world. And that is what the Blessed One said and the bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted with the Blessed One's words. So now we have read through the sutta, pretty short, but it causes a lot of questions. And I, you know, have been asked by more than about maybe 15 people, <laughs> Please tell us what this was about, you know? So there's two ways um, that we can go through this. And uh, the first way I'm going to show you on the whiteboard. I am, I am, I am. Let's see, here we go. I put the, very carefully put them in there. And might do this because I, I want to also entertain some questions with this to see where you are stuck. But let's, let me see if we can go through the, the point system this time. So I sent you the commentary and we, we're going to look at that step by step. Okay, and then we're gonna look at the 19 points and see we're getting smaller and smaller with this. First, we looked at a sutta as a whole now we're going to look at the pieces that were taught in the 19 points and, and to point them out to you what was happening in there. Then we're going to go to the commentary the way I wrote it and go through this again, but explain each part of the teaching as it goes along. Okay. Okay. Let me see if I can get to the whiteboard. Mm -hmm. Oh, only one of them came up. Oh my goodness. No, that, okay, well, this is the, I need this one first anyway. So only one came up. I wonder why. Um, I can go get the other one. Okay, so. Okay, if you have this one, this one is the one that was put most recently together. I don't know what that is. I don't know if I can get a full page here or not to look at this. I don't think I can. I don't know what that is. Oh, that's not good. Here we go. Okay. I'm going to put you guys up the top, I think. Let's see. See what happens if I put you up here. <laughs> there. Okay. So now this is a summary of one page and the big, you know, I became fascinated with this sutta for one reason, like a child. I, I really wanted to know what in the world did he teach the, the monk, the wanderer in, in what turns out to be possibly even four or five hours uh, before the morning comes. What did he, what was it that he taught him? And we see, we went through this and it took us about 45 minutes to do this, I think it was. And um, so having had that presented, we see he's got about three, four hours left to teach this monk. So what is the, the, the gut part of what he, the core of what he taught? So 
the front part of the sutta is just the setting of the stage. And my assumption when I examined the whole thing, I also wanted to know what could possibly have been in a set of gold plates sent from King Pasanati to Pukasati before he became a monk and came, started to make this journey. So in this first paragraph, I'm telling you, I, let's just assume that Pukasati already knows a lot of unconnected knowledge. He knows a lot of knowledge, a lot of Dhamma, but it's not yet really maybe totally connected. He knows the Four Noble Truths, the Five Precepts for Protection from Five Hindrances, the Five Aggregates that can make up the person. He knows has been exposed probably from the Six Sense Doors and the Three Kinds, at least three kinds of feeling. And then he's probably been uh, in what King Pasanati wrote, whether he knew it or not, he was probably talking about seven links in the dependent origination at uh, no more than seven. And then the Noble Eightfold Path was very probably, that was given to him with a suggestion, uh, a suggested escape to practice in life using right effort based on the folds, number six, seven, and eight, the, the last three folds of the Eightfold Path. So if you go and look at the Eightfold Path, you have um, Samawayama, Samasati, and Samasamadhi. So you're talking about uh, the right effort, you're talking about mindfulness, and you're talking about uh, a balanced, productive concentration. That's what you're talking about. He's probably been practicing at least with that. He may have been practicing uh, some of the breath, but I kind of doubt it. I kind of think he was. As per commentary, he had four janas uh, as per Bhikkhu Bodhi commentary. Yes. So that has not been confirmed, but uh, that is. That's right. He had four janas established by the time he came to talk to the Buddha and everything. And then he gets this information now this the, the the what's happening here you're right what's happening here in this in this uh shed is things are starting to tie together things that are starting to come together like i talk about the weaving together the uselessness of constantly cubby holding different pieces of the dhamma but how wonderful it gets when you start putting it, it together in a functioning piece so he's gotten, he had himself enough balance and equanimity with the fourth jhana uh, in order to, um, to get, decide to take this trip and go, you know, and come. And he was sitting very, very well. So the teaching starts in the text, the teaching starts um, at section eight is where it really starts or the, I'm sorry, section seven. And so you see the outline of the being. So very quickly here, let's go down what is actually in the teaching first, so before we go into the commentary piece itself, okay? It's the outline of what a human being is, is the first point. The second point is the six elements based on the internal body and the sense experience externally. The third part of the teaching is the instruction for mental explorations. And then the fourth part is four practice foundations. Um, uh, oh, I don't know what that word is. <laughs> Not to neglect wisdom, to preserve truth, to cultivate relinquishment, to train for peace. This is a framework for him to work in pulling stuff together. And these four pieces merge together to something very powerful. Okay, um, and then the next piece is the investigation path through the jhanas, one, two, three, and four, to reach the level of purification of mind, a clear, as clear and pure as pure gold, so that you can, seven part is discovery, discover the basis of infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness, and neither perception or non-perception. Now let's remember, 
when we're saying he was up to the fourth jhana, it could be he was up to the fourth jhana, the way we, we talk about it with strong equanimity and he decides to take this journey, or it could mean he may have talked, had it been exposed to uh, something about infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness and neither perception or non-perception. But it doesn't sound to me, it sounds to me like he made the trip with very strong equanimity and commitment to finding the Buddha. And that after, uh, you know, at, at the point where he's meditating, by the time he gets to the Buddha, he's learning about what these experiences are. Now, the reason I'm saying that is because I've experienced with working with Bonzi where someone shows up and they've actually had, in their talking to us about how they've been practicing, they're actually describing to us, um, you know, infinite space and infinite consciousness and nothingness, but they don't know it. They don't know where they are. It's like talking about an ocean, but you don't know what water is. Uh, it's amazing, you know, and the person showed up and once we explained everything, they were amazed to find out how far they were in the mental jhanas, but they didn't know they were describing them until they started talking about it. So it puts the person in their position when you get uh, going with very strongly with the practice and up to seven points here in order to reach Nibbana. He's set up to reach Nibbana. He is set up and maybe he's even, he has, uh, according to the end of the story, probably he's Sakadagami by the time he gets to the Buddha. He can be uh, Sotapanna and Sotapanna fruition, Sakadagami, Sakadagami fruition from studying and learning and, and practicing and seeing. This is what can happen, you see, if you have enough guidance to pull it together. And that's why I say we're just pointers. We point to how to hook it together. So then he fully understands, he has to fully understand Anicca and there's points that are teaching Anicca in one part. And then the discover what clarity of mind and living within the present time is about, that's in the lesson and eliminating emotional upheaval without death. That's interesting. When you're talking about eliminating emotional upheaval means you're coming disenchanted and disillusioned, uh, I mean, sorry, disenchanted and dispassion. When you're using that in life, you don't become emotional anymore, but you don't have to die to end emotions. This is the point he's making. You can live your life without getting over emotional. It doesn't mean you don't feel. It doesn't mean that you don't feel and respond, but you don't react in highly emotional states. Discovering truth that is unshakable, discovering what that is, and then uh, the Buddha reviews what he just taught above from 13 back, okay, and he reviews it again which is common in his uh, important suttas that he tells you what he's going to teach. You get a picture frame of it, and then he teaches it. And then at the end, he puts a review summary in front of you, which we will see that. And then the Buddha shows him someone without any knowledge, with an untrained mind, and then he shows you somebody with a trained mind. So he described, you remember we saw that paragraph near the end, he's talking about what's like for the person with the untrained mind versus the person with the trained mind, with the knowledge and information versus without the knowledge and information. And then the Buddha summarizes training for peace, pointing out again how the value of this. And he points out uh, an Atta explanation and how to escape. He tells you that. And then uh, he using Atta perspective and impersonal perspective. Remember, we always say, I'm sorry, Atta is the personal perspective. The personal perspective, whoops, and that should be Anatta. So change that one here. The using Anatta perspective for training and for life. That is his recommendation. Okay? to use anatta, this should be anatta there, I slipped. Okay, and number 18 uh, is applying atta versus anatta understanding. 
And that flows into going through to practicing right effort in order to learn the value of how to let go of Atta and get into Anatta perspective. And then the forgiveness is included in this, in this lesson at the end where he begs forgiveness from the Buddha and why that happens, which is explained in the commentary. And, okay, and then forgiveness is very important to keep our minds clear for training and life. And then at the end just says, you know, Puka, Pukasati realizes the master, the Buddha is there with him in the shed. He apologizes for calling him a friend. And the Buddha says, we forgive you. And that's because the Buddha is the head of everybody. So when he forgives, he forgives for the whole Sangha. When he was there, he has the power to do that. When, when Now we say the monk, when uh, you get forgiveness from a monk, the monk is representing the whole Sangha. You will hear Bhante say this in a retreat. You'll say very quietly, when you ask forgiveness, Kayena, Wacha Chitena, I can't remember the whole thing, okay? But when you ask that, he says, now, listen, be quiet and listen. I am the monk and I represent the whole entire Sangha. I am forgiving you. From this point, you are clean and now you keep going. This is what's happening here, okay? That's how it's done when you are forgiven and you wipe clean, say your precepts, keep going. Uh, he tells Pukisati to always cleanse your mind of any wrongdoing, never keep it inside of you, uh, as you train or in life. This is the message he's giving him there. And this is so that you can train and live your life with peace of mind. And mind is the forerunner of everything. If peace of mind, it flows to peace. Always confess out loud to yourself or another. Um, forgive yourself and say your precepts again, then continue on to train and to live. And now Pukasati requests to be ordained and the Buddha accepts Pukasati. He leaves to go get his robe and then he dies. This is the, this is the story. All right, now I have to go for just a minute. We have, to, we have to go out of here for a second. Well, how do I do this? Let's see what happens. Okay, I have to, <laughs> let me go back here and get it. I can't get it here. Um, right. There you go. Now, so this is the commentary. And what happened was I got so into this in 2009 that he said, okay, this is your project. I want you to, to take the sutta and to take it apart and so that you understand every single part of it. So I went back into it and this is what happened. So the first part of this we can skip in the beginning is telling you how this all starts how this starts in the front. I just wrote you a note. I told you, you know, why I did this. And it's just a, a nagging question. These two people inside the shed and what happened in there? You know, what exactly Sister did Kema, he do? Uh, yeah. Do you want to share this uh, one pager with us? I'm, I've got it on the screen for you. Can you see it? Yeah, but uh, do you want to send it to us uh, to, uh, so I can send it to everybody? Don't you have it? The whole, the whole no, comment? No. You gave the me the other one, oh, the, the bigger the version. Oh, you didn't have the one page. No. Yeah. Do you want me to do it now or later? Now? Later you can do it. Okay. okay. Later. I thought you already had it. I'll, I'll send it as soon as I'm done. Okay? Okay. No problem. Okay. Because the one page is unique because you can just see this is what happened. All right. So this is 2,552 years later. We're talking about what happened inside the shed. <laughs> And we were fascinated with this, you know. How long can you remember what happened inside a shed for one night? So here's the front of the front of the of the uh, document, the front of the sutta at the beginning, and then we go down here. Now a person consists of six elements. This is giving you a framework. 
for what he's going to show him. And it has to do uh, the six elements statement. The person consists of six elements, six bases of contact, 18 kinds of mental exploration. He has four foundations, the tides of conceiving, do not sweep over one who stands upon these foundations. When the tides of conceiving no longer sweep over him, he's called a sage at peace. So he's taking him from outside all the way to Nibbana, to the state of a sage of peace. And one should not neglect wisdom, should preserve truth, should cultivate relinquishment, and should train for peace. And what does it all mean? And this is a summary of the exploration, explore, exposition of the six elements. So when we go here, the Buddha stops along the way to spend the night, and he's a group of monks, he shares the space, um, and then uh, the Venerable Pukasati is taken up the robes in the name of Gautama as a teacher, but he, although he took the robes in, it, in his name, he's never actually seen the Buddha. And the Buddha discovers this, and because of the sincerity of the monk, he decides to teach the monk this night on the basic approach to the Dhamma, and he attempts to give Pukasati his teachings so that he can then perfect his understanding and practice. And the next piece, we go into the elements. He, after he says the six element consists of six elements, um, the reference uh, that he's just naming them. Now, understand the Buddha did teach the traditional four elements in the beginning of his teachings. But as he went further along, he moves into some suttas with five elements and then eventually to six elements. So I want, in this case, you're going to get to see all six of the elements, but he teaches the elements traditionally in, in the Buddhist uh, teaching in relationship directly to the body is what is so important. The part, not the external part about looking all around and everything. You can learn a lot that way about what they actually are, but he's teaching in reference to the person, the individual in their body. So the, the first, he first reviews the six elements, the earth, water, fire, air, space, consciousness. I'm, I, yeah, right. First, earth, air, fire, earth, water, fire, air, I'm oh, sorry, space and consciousness, all right. Uh, then he, uh, the person consists of six bases of contact so, and with what was referenced this about, there are the base of eye content. And it takes you through the six, six uh, bases, okay, now. And it, this is just reciting the six bases of eye contact, ear contact, nose contact, tongue contact, body contact, and the base of mind uh, contact. And so in reference to what was this said, and so here, here he goes, he says, he then presents how the being has these six bases, these doors for experience to happen through which contact can occur. And as the eye contact, ear contact, nose contact, tongue contact, body contact, mind contact. And you will note how uh, he does not go into precisely how these contacts take place. In other words, he's not going back that far into it. Remember, he's there just one night, you know. And he probably heard this part before. But to make contact, the eye, for instance, meets a form and eye consciousness comes in as the mental part of it. And then contact happens and perception jumps in to this little game and says red rose. And that's how you see a red rose. If you smell jasmine, the, the nose touches the odor and the nose consciousness comes in. So there's always three pieces for the contact and the naming of it when the contact is, by the time the contact happens very quickly, by that time perception has said jasmine, night jasmine, okay, something like that. Okay, so you can review the contact and how it's happening by going to the Mahatanha Sankhya Sutta or to the Chichaka Sutta, either place. That's 38 or 148, section 28. And Majima Nikaya uh, 38, just go and look for it. It's in the front part where contact is in that sutta, the story of Sakasati. Now, at 10, we're talking about 18 kinds of mental exploration. 
And then we have to figure out what is he talking about mental exploration? Well, what he's doing in that, in that paragraph, he explains 18 kinds of mental exploration of six sets of arising joy, six sets referring to balance, um, which is not quite the same as equanimity, but it's a form of balance. And then what is going on here is actually a proper form of investigation with observation of how everything is happening, of how these things are arising and passing away. If one's practice is aligned with proper instruction for mindfulness observation, and you understand mindfulness is observation, it's not concentrating on something, it's watching, witnessing, not personally getting involved, and practicing to witness the operation of the links uh, from, the, uh, from where they begin their meditation, then it, become, it becomes uh, clear that the object of the meditation centers us to see clearly the four noble truths, the 12 modes, and the three characteristics. So, you know, your four noble truths are your investigation pattern. In, that, keep that in mind all the time when you're practicing. You're asking the questions just like the Buddha did. Where is the suffering in this? What is the cause of everything? Even if you're examining contact, arising, passing, well, I don't care. What is the cause? What is it? What is the cause of it? What is the cessation? How is it all working? Constantly getting you to think in terms of analyzing very, very clearly how everything is operating. That's what this is all about. The 12 modes are the 12 links of dependent origination having to do with human cognition. I didn't have a class after you heard in the retreat the dependent origination, but we, I can send you, you should go find the dependent origination workshop online. It just really explains it very well. And then three characteristics, you're, you're, you're experiencing these all the time. Characteristics are um, laws that exist regarding the training and discovery in meditation. And it's anicca, dukkha, anatta. So anicca is the impermanence. Nothing is permanent. Everything arises, passes away. We remember that. It's really important. Dukkha is the suffering, which is hitting the craving and getting involved with the clinging and stuck in the clinging, clinging, and falling into the habitual tendency. And the last one is anatta. And anatta is the escape, the antidote. Always remember that. The anatta teaching was the escape teaching for day-to-day -day relief, but also overall for the whole program in the larger sense too. Remember about the 12 modes of, when you think of the 12 modes or dependent origination, you hear about them taught across lifetimes. You hear them taught scientifically <coughs> very fast even do it that fast. <laughs> but he will say the circle spins 250,000 times in one click like that. Is that going to help you to figure out your relationship while you're in lockdown? No, <laughs> doesn't help, you know. Don't force yourself to try to look there, you know. And the one about the three lifetimes is very and at best, it's a guesstimate thing. Um, and you, it's in, if you learn a lot about karma, you can say it's really real. You know it's real from the smaller part that you experience. You know it must carry through to the larger one down here. But it's, the point is, does it solve anything for you here to get stuck? talking in reference to your past life, this life and the next life. And it doesn't solve your relationships 
and I'm interested in how it can help people to be util utilized in, in work in, in the world. And that's the most important part is understanding it from that perspective, we're taking one event. So our examination of the 12 modes is defiantly, <laughs> defiantly as um, one phenomenological event at a time. This is not obscure. This theory for looking at the solution to anger was looked at in the 1940s before World War II in the psychological community. But after World War II, later on, this became part of the behavioral modification therapy that came up later. And it started with a man, Dr. Harvey, in 1940, but it got cut off with the war. And then we see it again in 40, well, I guess the seeds of it were in the 50s. It pops up again and it becomes the behavioral modification theory of solving something instead of talking about it we're going to look at exactly how one incident between two people happen and learn how that operates so that we know more about how we can alter our behavior that's what seems to be really effective okay oh i get such a scratchy thing here Mm. Ah, India. <laughs> I've had this like this ever since I've been in India. It's really funny. <laughs> okay. Now, then it becomes clear that it actually is being examined and going on here. What's happening when this is investigated? If the practice is something else, uh, it won't make clear sense why someone would attempt to see any such philosophical theory and try to, it might even be assumed to just be a contradiction in the purpose of the whole thing. If we start talking about actuating this because some school of thinking is, ism is this wonderful philosophy, but then I always go back to Keshri Dhammananda, the late Keshri, Venerable Keshri Dhammananda and his statement, philosophy is a lot of thinking without doing. You can go to lunch and talk philosophy, but in the office you can't solve your problems at the office in interaction. Philosophy doesn't do that. But the Buddha went beyond the philosophy into theory. So he wasn't stopping scientifically with a hypothesis. He's dealing with an act, a theory and then action. And that's why I like this. Okay, the, the, the bhikkhu, the person has four foundations and this neck part in section 11. And, and the four foundations are actually four practice foundations. They're foundations for studying. And these four foundations for study are wisdom, truth, relinquishment, and peace. That's in section 11. Wisdom is coming to understand the four noble truths and the impersonal process of dependent origination. That's how everything works, you know? That's uh, what is the suffering? What is the cause of it? What is the cessation of it? And how do I get to it? And 12 links to dependent origination is how does it work in the human being? Precisely between the mind and speech and action. How does the invent happen? Okay. Truth is that which is the full knowledge of the Four Noble Truths revealed in every aspect coming to know the meaning of what they are and how they can be used in life. If you were at some of the other lessons I taught, we took the Four Noble Truths and talked about four or five ways that you can use them in life, many different ways. They're not just this little statement, what's Buddhism, the Four Noble Truths. That's not the end of it. It's his investigation pattern. It's how he discovers things when he examines things. It's how he puts together his talks, plans his lessons, designs his suttas. And it's also his peace, uh, peace re re uh, negotiations with kings and things. This is what he uses. He uses the Four Noble Truth steps to solve the problem. Relinquishment is referring to giving up and abandoning greed, hatred, and delusion. Uh, this simple to say greed, hatred, and delusion, uh, lobado, samoha, is, is to 
uh, you have to understand greed is the lust and greed and the hatred is hatred and aversion, which has this grabbing onto or this pushing away energy that exhausts us in life and delusion in Buddhism means uh, that uh, this false idea that everything that's happening is me, it is my fault, it is my, it's therefore I am to blame. I carry the resp responsibility for everything, all my whole experience. You are responsible for your life, but uh, you don't have to take everything personally to figure out life. You take things more impersonally. Um, Peace, the meaning is to understand how to open humanity's doorway to peace. And the way this is to let go of the conceiving. Conceiving means I want and the I don't want. And I remember how it was, so it must be going to be this way. And what might happen in the future? And let's talk about that. And how many times have I showed you how you spend your energy and you need just the energy for today and don't divide it in three and give it to the past and worry about the future, but go into your, your, uh, your tasks at hand in present time. And I do not agree with using present moment. I think it's cute, but look at your watch and tell me which one of you has gotten the headache this week trying to stay in a present moment, which is a portion of a second and stay there. I just, you're just gonna, the man came in to, for the interview at the retreat and he says to me, I, how's it? I said, how's it going? He says, I have such a headache. I don't know what I'm gonna do. I, what are you doing? I have been working all morning trying to stay in the present moment and I cannot do that. And I, I didn't know what to say at first. I was totally shocked at this sort of, idiocy of this idea I have to stay in a present moment. It's, a, it's, tr it's kind of like a pendulum where, uh, okay, the theory of a pendulum, if I you know, had a, something to swing, like, okay, the theory of me swinging the pendulum is you're stuck at the nine and I want you to be at the three, uh, a six. I want you to live at the six and the six is peace. And over here at the three, that's the past, and the nine is the future. So uh, what I do is I, I swing this this way, but eventually you're going to see if you just left it alone, it would end up here. But if you're stuck here, I'm going to push you over here before you get to here. Or if you're here, I'm going to push you over there before you get to here. This is the method of training he's using. It's a simple thing. I can see him sitting there in his, how am I gonna teach him that? <laughs> oh, look, here's a thing, we're swinging. <laughs> can see this, you know? <laughs> okay. Um, one should not neglect, this is the lesson is don't neglect wisdom. Observing the impersonal process of dependent origination and how everything is actually happening all the time. That's the most important. How is this happening? Don't get involved in the future and the past. Look at, I, it's really interesting to really for a whole day, how is this happening? How is this happening? And then suddenly you realize also it's not happening to you. It's happening from you. <laughs> And all of a sudden, you can open up and smile and breathe, okay? Should preserve truth, should preserve the clear understanding of the noble truths once they are uncovered personally and, and you get the lesson about how they work. Should cultivate relinquishment. This means at any level with the student can do this within their lives. They should do it to train successfully like short or long retreats, temporary ordinations, two weeks at a time or longer periods of ordination. And they should study the way that we're exchanging and they should ask questions and share with each other in, in their study setups, not just listen to a sort of dictatorial kind of teaching uh, one woman, you know, this, the reason I'm, about, I'm all about that is because when I was first in Sri Lanka in 2012, I went to a conference in Anuradhapura in the northern part of the island at a Bhikshu University. And we went to the Anuradhapura, we went to the ruins 
And at the ruins, there were thousands of people there because something was happening. And I was in an orange robe walking around the big pagoda that's there. And there was about three or 400 women in white. And they were all older women. And one woman came running up to me and said, please, 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 will you teach us? Come and teach us for a week. Well, the problem was I went to the conference and I had tickets to go back to the United States shortly afterwards. I couldn't stay there and do this. I wasn't ready yet. But the, the important thing is, what did she say to me? And what she said broke my heart. She said, I said, don't you have someone who will teach you? And she went, there were monks over here teaching 500 people and another monks over here teaching 300 people. And uh, she said, you don't understand. All of us are women from the war and we have lost our fathers and our husbands and our sons. And now we're like 72 years old and our children that were left are grown up and we finally want to hear the Dhamma. And I said to her, I, I was ignorant at that time of this whole situation. I, and I said, well, you're in Sri Lanka. This is the heart of, of Buddhism. And all of you women, you don't understand what happened, what he taught, what he did. And, they, and she said to me, just like this, I'm 72 years old. And I went to the temple every Sunday of my life. And I have not ever gotten beyond the precepts and the Eightfold Path to be taught anything about what this is. And before I die, we want to know what this was. Now, when I went back there, I couldn't find them. I didn't know how to find them. A number of years later, I was back there in 2014. I, I didn't know how to find them again. Uh, but this was a, such an impact on me that they grew up there, but they never actually knew what the gift was from the Buddha, which was the cessation of suffering, day-to-day -day suffering, learning how to have the cessation of day-to-day -day suffering, not permanently, you know, but a system of escape to use in their life. And it broke my heart. That's just a fact. So you should cultivate relinquishment means that uh, at any level which the student can do within their lives, they should Re take relinquishment and this means the sh different levels of practice and then should train for peace. This means training for peace is in, in oneself first, which in turn will shine outward and affect the world around you. You'll start finding people asking you, what are you doing? Which spa did you go to? What happened to you last week? <laughs> Very funny questions people tell me, you know, and <laughs> Uh, the world around you through everything that you're doing, you're going to start shining. Okay, that next one, how the bhikkhu do, uh, does one not neglect wisdom? Uh, how, and uh, there are these six elements, the earth element, water element, fire element, air element, space element, and consciousness element. Now, we're not going to read these again. So we're going to go the earth element. And the lesson here is he teaches you everything concerning the elements as something that is, is part of the body. So we understand the solid parts are the earth element. When we go to the water element, we understand that it is the water in the body that is the water element he's talking about. And then we look at the um, fire element, which is the heat of the temperature of the body and digestion system and how the person ages from the, the heat that is in the body. And, Maybe I should move to uh, the South Pole or something. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Don't forget that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the aging one we're giggling about now. Okay. The air element is the breathing. He's the air. And this is a wonderful one to recite. I love this. You know, the up going and the down going and the winds in the belly and the winds in the bowels. <laughs> Yeah, it's all there. Okay, with the course through the limbs, it goes through the limbs. Sometimes you can have uh, soreness in your, uh, your um, lungs from the air getting between the outer part and the inner part of the lungs. It's very serious. This would be sorry for, so all these things are part of the air element, what's going on in the body. He's also making a point 
when he goes through all the teaching of the body, is it overemphasis? This is not me. This is not mine. This is not myself. This is just the body. That's the whole lesson. This is just what it is to accept things as what they are in the present time. So he has this ongoing teaching, the present time, okay? And it's not me, it's not mine, it's not myself, it's just what it is. This is what he's trying to get you to look at, to do what? To stop taking things personally. And the, the space element, someone said, what is that space element? Well, you read it again, it's pretty clear, really. Okay, because here you're saying it's all the holes in your body, the holes in the ears, the holes in the nostril, door of the mouth. There's air. There's not, it's not a place for the air element. It's the space element. You're not breathing if you just close your mouth. You see? That's not an air play issue. That's the space issue. Also, if you can go online, watch them uh, do an autopsy or to do an operation, you'll see the space in between the organs inside the body when they open the body, and you'll see there's all there is space in there. It's not just so, a Tana, uh, Do you want to remove this uh, uh, document so your uh, you can uh, be a visual uh, available? I, I wish that I could, but I don't have a second computer. That's my problem. I have to got, be guided by that, you know. I'm not sure how to do this because I don't have, well, I, <laughs> I didn't print it out. <laughs> I don't have a printer, remember? Okay. So that's why I was doing that. I can come back and forth a little bit. I'll try to oh. come, I'll try to come back and no, forth. You can have the document on the uh, foreground and we can still see you. Oh, really? Uh, okay. Do you want me to, can I make them a little bit bigger than they are? Or I can't yeah, see yeah, them. Yeah, you can do whatever you want. How do you do that? Um, I don't know how you do that. Oh, wait, I, I got an idea. Maybe I know what you're talking about. Wait, um, how do I get back to the, I don't know how to get back there now. Yeah, you share blink. screen, share screen. I can't find the, the marker now because you flipped me up. Could you put me back? <laughs> I can't see it anywhere. Um, I love share. this. Screen. Share it's, screen. It's not there. In the bottom you'll see. Mm -hmm. It's not there anymore. Um, whatever you did, you, I, what's this? I can't. Oh my gosh, I can't read. Um, <laughs> it's not there, Bunty. It's, all right, wait. I'm t I don't know what to touch it or not. Uh, you, you can you can't can you see me now? Yes. Okay. All right. You can see me now. You're happy. Okay. So I can stay with it. Okay. So the space part I explained to you. Okay. So um. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then uh, the the uh, so the lesson is really the six L direct relationship to the body. And how to practice a drill with each element while understanding the reality of such an element and nothing more using the repeated affirmation that this is not me, this is not, this I am not, this is not myself. You go through a few days like this as you're walking, as you're driving, as you're disturbed, as anything's happening. You go in the office, something's happening. The moment the person walks away, if you want to say it, you can just say, well, it's not mine. It's not, uh, uh, this I am not. This is not myself. This is just something that's happening outside of, of this, outside here. And you're not taking any, it's a practice. It's a drill formation of moving from Atta, where you believe everything is part of you and it's coming down on you to shifting to letting go and everything is anatta. It is not me. It is not mine. It is not myself. It is just what it is. That's the, that's the system. And you put up little signs. People say, how, how did you learn this? Oh my gosh. I got five by seven cards and I, uh, I wrote them out. And I had them on the bathroom, on the door, and in the kitchen when I'm cooking on the door, when I am reading by the chair, when I'm sitting in the couch. Yeah, I had them all over the place. 
And uh, in high school, there was the thing I learned, if you want anybody to, uh, you want to advertise something uh, in an organization, you don't have to make a big poster and spend money to do that. You, if you make a small poster this big and type the announcement on it and put it on the door of the, or the offices, People will walk up in groups to read, oh, what does that sign say? Let me see. Oh, look. <laughs> it's the cheapest way to advertise I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> okay, the next one is consciousness. And consciousness, let's look again. Consciousness cognizes. Uh, this is pleasant. Uh, cognizes. This is painful. Cognizes. This is neither pleasant or painful. Cognizing something means seeing it and understanding what it is. Now, in the 60s, I could say to you, this means to grok something, G-R-O-K. But if you didn't read Heinrich Heinlein's novels, <laughs> you don't know what grokking is. Grokking is looking, looking at this and wanting to understand what this is. So I shall sit here and grok the glass container and grok the water. Means I will become the glass container. I will, in my mind, become the water. This is grokking, grokking. And, he, and the Buddha was talking about grokking. This is what this is. It's just painful. This is just this. That's the whole lesson here. So, and even feelings that come up, when the feeling comes up, one understands with the cessation of the same contact where the feeling came up, once that goes away, it's going to pass away because of Anicca. That's why I say Anicca is your friend. Whatever you don't like, it's going to go away. So just keep going until you're finished. Now we have this one, the, the um, um, In a nutshell, the teachings are like a dance. Um, uh, they are like a weaving or like a dance. And once you have all the pieces together and start using the whole thing, you see what happens. You do something wrong, you say you're sorry, you take the precepts again, you start again. You, it's like taking a personal eraser on your brain and saying, I'm sorry I put that one in here. I didn't mean to think about what she said and he said, and they said, just, I just can go on. And after a while, your brain helps you because the big thing here uh, that I see is that in the time of the Buddha, he didn't have the science for what he was doing, but <clears throat> he was essentially practicing uh, the rebuilding of your neural pathways in your brain. That's what he was doing. So the science is here now. So when you want to understand it, if you, if you ask me, if you write me a note and say, well, where is that? Um, you go Google this and Google that. And it takes you into looking at how do you change a habit for your brain? How do you change your habit if you're over 25? You have to do the, you'd like this. The moment you start to do the wrong habit, you have to start doing the right habit, the right habit, the right habit, the right habit. And eventually, the old habit dies because you're not paying attention to it anymore. And it shrivels up in the brain, it breaks off, and you have built a new path. And the new path is moving towards wholesome mind states and uh, supportive thinking for you in life. So it's an interesting point to further examine that the, the change on unwholesome contact occurring through the line of cognition, you're stuck in place you have to change through the gradual step-by-step -step, um, dismissing and let going of the birth of the wrong action and then let going to the hip habitual tendency to do the bad thing and then repeating uh, and then giving up uh, the repeating of the clinging stories about why you always do that the wrong way. And then finally, when you see that you're doing that, you see the imperfection of that behavior and then you don't do it anymore because you finally see what you're doing. The only way you can do it is to get a small little um, your diary and just write down when things happen, just have a cup of coffee, jot down exactly how it happened. When you go home, you sit and contemplate that. Pretty soon, you're gonna see where your habitual tendencies are, your habitual tendencies. And don't worry about the other person. You can't change them. 
you you have to look at yourself in your space and change yourself that's the only control there is here okay that's all you've got kindergarten 101 I am here and I have this space around me and that's the only space I'm responsible for is this part around me. So don't bother that child and don't bother that child. That's, you remember kindergarten, you got to remember you're only able to control your own space. Okay, the next part in, um, goes to, um, uh, the next part is 20 and in 20 you're talking about it gives an example of equanimity, but if you don't understand what equanimity is in this section 20, it won't come across fully, which makes this a little bit tricky. The sutta is assuming the monk uh, being taught has the basis of correct practice already in place and it's operating and that he already had some of the deeper understanding of what equanimity is. To explain it the best way, I can only explain it is, is, is that it is extremely, extremely stabilized, firm, and balanced mind that cannot be um, recorded as disturbed by any sensual input. Sense input means hearing something, seeing something, feeling something, anything like that. But when you're in a state of real equanimity, your mind does not jump at all. And it's not just your mind, because um, I went through an incident where um, it, I'm not going to go through the whole story of the truck. You can ask me to send you a copy of the story of the truck, but the truck lost the brakes and I had to do what I had to do to get to the bottom of the mountain without brakes. And at the bottom, I was shocked that when I stopped the truck, my heart beat was not beating any faster than a runner's pulse at 59, uh, you know, 55, I think it was like 55. And, and my stomach was not upset and my head was not throbbing. I was no fear. There was no uh, bodily response could not have been recorded. It's beyond, what is, equanimity is beyond the description of calm or tranquil. It's one step further along towards moving towards disenchantment where and to be enchanted by something is to be interested in that and uh you just love it you want to go to the mall all the time or something <laughs> and you're disenchanted with the mall you'd rather stay home and sit a couple of extra sittings in meditation dispassion is i don't i'm not i'm not the world is not there i'm letting go of it this much and imperturbability means experiencing a mind that cannot be disturbed at all by any means whatsoever. Even if somebody rang a bell beside your head or hit you with a two by four, you would not have any response. Um, so this is the, imp just not, you just wouldn't have any response, but it's not the same as um, absorption meditation. It's different. This is what is important. You can have this equanimity develop strongly without absorption. And this is a, a extremely uh, difficult to explain without recalling periodic incidents and such. Uh, essentially, the practice is going on in an aligned instruction with the suttas. Equanimity naturally develops and becomes firmly established in the fourth jhana as a preparation for the stability that's needed for the mental state experience. You cannot experience infinite space comfortably and sit there for periods of time unless your body's gone and you don't feel it anymore and you're in this state of, very, of pretty strong equanimity, okay? Um, the next one, 21, uh, when one gets into the base of infinite space equanimity, it allow, if allowed to, it will grow firmer and firmer, but for most, they are not through with trying to hold on to it yet. This is the problem. Now, this is a big problem for the meditators when we take them in an online retreat and we don't have them right in front of us for, and we don't do the Dhamma talks according to what they need. We're trying to work from a list, it's different. 
Um, so we have a tough time with this because this is an issue for Otto once again. Uh, what I said, if allowed to, equanimity will grow firmer and firmer. But for most people, a lot of times you go through a phase where you're just not, not through with trying to hold on to it yet. You want to be in control. You want to see yourself driving down the path. And thus, it periodically, it keeps fading out or coming back or fading out. You get knocked out of a jhana due to your own stubborn personal desire to make a jhana stay longer. That's how you fall out of it sometimes. If you're there anymore, the more that you're personally there, the less you get to experience and the less you get to understand. This is all because of your personal desire, which is Atta, whom you thought had left the stage, but it has returned and snuck in and it refuses to, to feel, let you feel the tranquility. The mat, now there is a thing when we're working in the deeper states, sometimes a student will get bored. And, and the question is, what am I supposed to do now? <laughs> You know, I've done everything you tell me. What am I supposed to do now? Well, we can teach you um, uh, after one attainment or two attainments, or even if you get bored with neither perception or non-perception, and for a while you want to try some things with strong equanimity, you can be taught to, to work with the mastery of determinations, but they're tricky. And this is a training uh, that some people, I will do it with other people if they're just going to do that and nothing else, I don't want them to do it. But a determination is, is what is a pronouncement to the brain of an internal intention you have that is uh, being implied to the brain through an indirect affirmation. So what do I mean? Only when one sets up a determination properly will the brain uh, the brain will have something happen in the meditation. Uh, does it most likely it it ha it doesn't always happen. You, you set it up wrongly, and it simply will not work, not ever. But if you understand the word determination in another way, then it is quite possible that you can train the brain to follow through when you lean and you do this. And it seems to work just fine when the brain is ready for such work. But if you try it for a day and you're really frustrated, I know right away, your brain's not ready for this. You're not communicating enough with the brain. You're trying to boss the brain around and the brain is sort of giggling on the side. It's kind of giggling. You know, like, I'm not really ready to, to let, I'm not going to do anything unless you set me loose. Once you're communicating with the brain, and, and then you can lean, and the brain goes just where you want it to go. You can see somebody in trouble with loving kindness and start your loving kindness and just say to the brain, send it to those five people who just had an accident. And, you know, it, it just leans in that direction, affecting the people around you. If you're doing the, uh, the periodic determinations, you can, you can say things like, I'm going to sit no higher than the third jhana. And already you're sitting in infinite space or infinite consciousness. And suppose you were bored, but you know your first, second, third, fourth, and then infinite space, infinite consciousness, but you never really got to know them. So maybe you'd like to stay in the first jhana for a whole day because you feel kind of down and you're not full of energy and you're not feeling happy that much. I will sit no higher than the first jhana. You sit and you say, I will go through my day no higher than the first jhana. There's a very good chance you will stay in the first jhana all day. That's just, it's a 90% sort of thing. But the moment you say, I will sit in the first jhana all day, no go. I, I'm going to do this or I will do it. No, you're being bossy. On, like, you're being bossy. I don't want to hear you. I'm up here in your head and I don't want to hear you, you bossing me around anymore. <laughs> that's, the, that's the thing that's going on. Okay, Buddhist teaching contains some great instructions to return to the natural state of universal laws and human potential. Everything must be accepted as impersonal and impermanent, just as it is in the forest, just as it is in the whole world. There is nothing more. One of the greatest secrets of the success in the meditation is allowing 
rather than controlling or producing anything to happen. This is true through all four levels of the understanding uh, mentioned here, the base of infinite space, the base of con infinite consciousness, the base of nothingness, neither, it's just allowing these things to happen. But they'll never happen if you go in like, okay, we're gonna do this. It's not gonna happen. So this is where when we hear a story about it saying, you know, that something could would not possible for seven, 10, 12 years, you know what, nobody is lying. As long as you do this, you know, really hard, it could take five or 10 years to even get to the first jhana. And it's a different kind of jhana, a very closed uh, thing with just the jhana there and nothing else, you know, and this is, it's a very different tr path, you know, and what they're saying is absolutely true. You can't say, well, that's not true. This is true. And that's not, it's not like that. We're telling you don't close your view inside as you're practicing because there's so much to discover. And the, instead of being like this, okay, as you're practicing like this, okay, we want you to be like that, even better. I want you to be like that, sort of like circlorama at the theater. This is a flat screen and this is circlorama where I can see back here and I can see all the way around inside to over here. Something starts to come up and go across in front of me. I just watch it. Something comes from down below and comes up. I just see it. Something comes from above or from the right. It comes up like that and across. Okay, I just see it. I don't care about any of it. Whatever arises is there to pass is away. That's all I want to know. It's always going to do that. I didn't ask it to come. So you're learning the impersonal nature of all of the phenomena with proper understanding and practice. Uh, the indication here is that equanimity can keep going indefinitely if you have the right conditions. Everything is concerning if you have the right conditions. It doesn't mean uh, the statement about clinging to this doesn't mean personally clinging to it. It means that the conditions are remaining right, you're leaving it alone and you've reached there, there's no reason for you to fall out of it. The whole thing has to do with believing anything that uh, uh, comes up as a hindrance has no value and no information, leave it alone and Nietzsche will take care of it. So this is about directing equanimity 21 and 22 a student sees and understands their progress is conditioned on their previous levels of understanding one by one as they occur within the practice their mindfulness is so well developed he verifies uh, what i just said above to you uh, that he does not form any condition or generate any volition meaning will or choice tending towards either being or non-being. Now we look at being and non-being. <clears throat> being means rea reacting, non-being, not reacting. Re anything leaning towards reacting personally or not reacting personally. When you look at it that way, you're looking at going towards stillness, stillness, and all the direction is towards stillness and peace. The word volition uh, means here the student's will to control what happens to arise, to come into being, or not to arise, to cease, or his desire to act to prevent it from arising. So you don't want volition involved, all right? If he does not crave, uh, this is important, if he does not crave and cling to anything in the world, he can become free from suffering. That's absolutely true. This means here, um, is that he does not grasp for a result. He just allows it to arise and relinquishes it as it disappears. He is not agitated. So the person who's not grabbing, not pushing, does not get agitated or irritated about anything. He is without any tension and tightness, isn't he? And your, your practice is, is based on letting go of all tension and tightness and that practice is supporting everything that is being said in the sutta. He personally attains Nibbana. 
when, we, when you hear uh, David likes to say it a lot, you know, if you practice the way we're teaching you, it'll take you all the way to Nibbana. It's true because we're teaching you to let go, relax, smile, and come back and not pay attention to anything or personally concerned with anything. And if you keep doing that, you're gonna build that framework in your mind and then your conditions will come up and the conditions will be right so you can fall into cessation. And this is the end of being. And I look at this as the end of habitual tendencies and reactions happening. It is the end of craving for the personal opinion to be or of that which is clinging, holding on to the stories, ideas, and concepts and opinions about anything. All of that is personal. These stop arising. In the end uh, of the cause of craving, which is Atta, and that is the I want it or I don't want it mind, everything stops. The urges simply cease to occur. From now on, when uh, any kind of feeling arises, there will now be an undisturbed space uh, for intelligent, peaceful responses to arise as needed, okay? That energy that I talked with you about from these existing links, okay? The existing links, the energy of it ceases. That means the craving, the jerk of the craving, the more speed with the clinging, the more complication with the habitual tendencies. Is like driving a car onto a freeway and going faster, 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 more complicated, you see? Uh, and then when the energy ceases to turn, the wheel of suffering onward from one life to the next, what happens? A lot of peace happens, a lot of peace. As the cooling is happening, uh, it becomes obvious that this is what happens in the future, okay? Now in 23 and 24, uh, he's talking about the result of this, uh, he feels the pleasant feeling, he understands it is impermanent. Um, there is no holding to it. There is no delight in it. He feels the painful feeling, he understands what it is, it is impermanent. There is no holding to it. There is no delight in it. He feels the neither painful nor pleasant feeling, he understands it is impermanent. There is no holding to it. There is no delight in it. The result of this is now demonstrated in the next part by showing what will happen with all future arising a painful, pleasant, or neither painful nor pleasant feeling. <clears throat> if he feels a pleasant feeling, he feels it detached. If he feels a painful feeling, he feels it detached. If he feels a neither painful nor pleasant, he feels it detached. If he feels a feeling terminating with the body, uh, something where the, the, um, something is crawling on you and then it falls off, it's terminating at, at the, on the, off the body. I feel the feeling terminating with the body, but when he feels the feeling terminating with the life itself, he feels, he understands, I just see this as it's time. This is the process of dying, which is part of life. And he understands on the dissolution of the body with the ending of the life, all that is felt not being delighted in will become cool right here. It, right away, it becomes cool there. And then we have the other part inside the body cools, leaves the body and the body cools. And just as an old oil lamp burns in dependence on the oil and wick, he tells you that section, okay? Uh, you know, when it's used up, if it does not get any more fuel, it's extinguished from lack of fuel. So too, when the, he feels the feeling terminating with the body and the, and the one terminating with life, he understands it is just what it is. He understands on the dissolution of the body with the ending of life that all is that is felt not being delighted in come cool right here. And when we go to 143, Majima Nikai number 143, we see that the training that was given to Anathapindika was the same way where he had training, how to take care of it while he's in pain in bed. And the pain, the dissolution, as it happened, in the training went smaller, 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 smaller. Only consciousness was left, if you remember that lesson. And then he's he's taking a breath in, a breath out, and he has died. And we talk about the easiness of dying if you understand the whole process of what's going on. There's no reason to go hysterical, get emotional, and get everything depending on what's going on. But the more you hold your mind, the better chance you have of survival. 
but at the time you're facing death, death is not this horrifying deep, deep pit, you know, that nobody knows what, how this is about. This is just simply the end story on the lifeline is much easier way of understanding. So death is part of life is what the Buddha is really trying to explain. So by the word detached, the Buddha is showing how there is nothing personal about any of this now. Why? Because one fully understands the impersonal nature of how everything actually works. And the student is now seeing things as they actually are. Without adding other concepts or ideas to the mix, he's acquired knowledge and vision. Oh, you don't do that to me now. Wait a second. Uh, where'd you go? Hold on a second. Um, oh, come here, come here, come here. Where are you? Hello? <laughs> okay, here we go. <laughs> the machines. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> uh, he understands. Uh, where, where, where do we go? Where do we go? He, uh, the student is now seeing things as they actually are without adding any concepts or ideas to the mix. He's diminishing, 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 diminishing. He's not diminishing like <laughs> as a person. He's getting smarter and smarter and smarter and smarter. It's really like this, you know, you ever see one of those things that's shaped like this and like that? You put a string on them and you go like this to them, you know, in balance. You're trying to get yourself totally in balance. I'm here, but I understand fully what all of this is about. It's happening. And then I can just do that thing on the string and throw it up and catch it and everything perfectly, you know, because I understand how everything's working. Okay. Um, then uh, here at 25, uh, bhikkhu possessing, wisdom possesses the supreme foundation of wisdom for this bhikkhu is the supreme noble wisdom, namely the knowledge of the destruction of all suffering. Now, listen, anyone who understands this clearly and has experienced its confirmation through proper observation of how it works. In other words, you see it and you experience it. Seeing the dependent origination in action and has the foundation for wisdom and comes to understand clearly what suffering actually is and sees what the cause of suffering is at its root and has seen the cessation even if it's minimally seen the cessation, like just inside of the six R steps, there's a spot where you can actually see the cessation. We talk about that. Therefore, he knows such a state as the cessation really does exist. And he is practicing with understanding all of the interconnected parts of the Eightfold Path to support his journey without engaging any obstacles that appear because he's following the instruction of the Buddha concerning the obstacles, concerning, the, the, it, concerning him, his sitting, his placing, his viewing, his watching, everything he's been taught in all the instructions the Buddha have given him, and especially about the, the, the hindrances he's understood and listened to very carefully. He understands all those things. His deliverance being founded upon truth is unshakable. For this is false, that is false bhikkhu, which has a deceptive nature, and that is true, which has an undeceptive nature, nibbana, okay? So what they're saying here is anything that is saying that it can happen without that is deceptive, and the undeceptive nature of nibbana is understanding all of this, following the recipe precisely, and ending up with the perfect cake, nibbana. The Nibbana cake, okay. So therefore, a bhikkhu possessing this truth possesses the supreme foundation of truth. For this bhikkhu is the supreme noble truth, namely Nibbana, which has an undeceptive nature. And this part here, truth, means the actual knowledge by seeing. The teaching, when taught clearly, is totally undeceptive. Everything I show you is not to deceive you, not to trick you. I'm just sh my job is just to point how it works. And when you repeatedly don't do all the steps of some part of it, my job is to underline what's missing and have you catch it in your report and show you underneath what was correct. And again and again and again and again and again until you finally say, you know, 
I just figured something out. <laughs> and I sit there and say, oh, that's wonderful. What a good discovery. <laughs> so teachers get a little frustrated with this. And we think part of the reason that this practice got lost was probably because it was so simple. And because it was so simple, it was easy to change. And when it was so easy to change, then they change it, you can never get the results again. But you're talking about the results, but they never happen. And to go back to the simple, simple, simple four steps of right effort, it's just nobody can believe that's right. You know, and so right effort got lost. And when right effort got lost, everybody seems to agree. It means work hard, persevere, keep going, be strong, push, 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 make it happen. That's right effort. But that's not right effort in Buddhism. That's right effort in the conventional reality. The, the truck is stuck on the hill. Everybody get out, <laughs> push the truck, <laughs> they can start again. That's that kind of effort. But we're talking about the ultimate reality. And the ultimate reality is different. The ultimate reality was so four steps recognized when you have an unwholesome mind state in your head. Let go of the unwholesome mind state and then bring up a wholesome mind state, okay? Bring up a wholesome mind state and then keep that one going and keep it going all day and make more wholesome mind states. That's the whole practice, the whole thing. Again and 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 again. That's how many times, million times. And then all of a sudden your little brain says, hey, wake up. Why, why I was sleeping. No, wake up. All right, I'm in here. What do you want? All right, look, I told you to keep doing it that way. Okay, 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 I'll do it. He's in there, he's in there. Or she's in there. Or the he, she is in there. You just have to communicate with it. If you can just link up with it you you your whole life can change your whole life can change i can't tell you so before here this part next part 27 this is where the buddha goes back and he starts to explain this is where you were before and this is where you came to it's always good to look at that you see if you made progress in this retreat in with relationships or you overcame something with a person uh, that had been a troublesome person and you made made progress in a couple of months you can turn around and look at this and say i was back there now i'm here do i still understand how this works look at what i learned i was back there this is what the buddha is doing it's valuable to look at what was but stay with what is and keep building it before you saw the truth that he would acquire craving and clinging and indulge in them to expand them into what is called in the path papancha. That's the incessant, um, you know, talking and incessant perpet per, uh, for what is it? Perpetual thinking. You see, and this is mental proliferation there you go mental proliferation full of thinking and analyzing that's personally unnecessary to discover truth remember how i drew for you the seed and the sprout and the tree in a drawing to demonstrate this the words vitaka vichara and papancha when i was working on this I was working on another project at the same time. We were talking about Vitaka, Vichara, Papancha. And this drawing represented what is called the rising of Papancha. And Nibbana is synonymous with the word Ni Papancha. So Vitaka is the thought and Vichara is the expansion of the thought into a tree and the papancha is growing the trees, branches, and the fruit, and keep thinking in the unwholesome is building and building and building, like that is the papancha. And the ni papancha, without that expansion, just taking something as it is. Formerly, when he was ignorant, he experienced covetousness, desire, and lust. Now he has abandoned them and cut them off at the root and made them like a palm stump and done away with them so that they are no longer subject to future arising. And formerly when he was ignorant, he experienced anger, ill will, and hatred. 
but now he has abandoned them and cut them off at the root and made them like a palm stump and done away with them so that they are no longer subject to future arising. And formally, he was, he was ignorant. He experienced ignorance and delusion. He, ignorance of the, of the Eightfold Path and of dependent origination. He didn't know anything about it. And delusion. He didn't know that he was wrapped up in, he didn't have to take everything personally. He didn't know that. But now he has abandoned this. He cut them off at the root and he let them go in the same way. And therefore, possessing peace possesses, he, being possessed of the supreme foundation of peace, the bhikkhu, the supreme noble peace, namely the pacification of the lust, hatred, and delusion by the replacement with loving kindness, compassion, and equanimity, and with the, um, with the um, anatta, you can say loving kindness, compassion, joy, equanimity, and the anatta, anatta perspective, you see? impersonal perspective. So now the Buddha is talking about what the earmarks of a good practicing student in this practice is. How do we know that the student has actually succeeded? We can see the differences in their daily life activities and many of the reactions now cease to arise in them. Covetousness, desire and lust dwindle away. Anger, ill will, hatred and aversion diminish. Ignorance, which means not knowing the four noble truths, falls away now. And delusion, which always means the idea of a personal self taking things personally, the personal perspective changes. And these things become less and less likely to arise within the interactions of their days. And because of the disappearance of these things in life, which were the source of heated reactions in life, and the foundations of very disturbing, destructive emotions, the student now has a foundation of peace. And so it was with reference to this that it was said one should not neglect wisdom, should preserve truth and cultivate relinquishment, and should retrain for peace. And this is the restatement of what each piece being discussed is once again. And the tides, then he says, the tides of conceiving do not sweep over one who stands upon these foundations. And when the tides of conceiving no longer sweep over them, he is called a sage at peace. And so it was, and with reference to what was this said? Well, the vicar says, I am, is a conceiving, a like I am that. And why did you say this to me? And why are you doing this to me? And how come this is happening to me? All these things. I am conceiving, I am. I am this is a conceiving. I shall be in the future is conceiving. I shall not be is conceiving. I shall be possessed of form is conceiving. I shall be formless in the con is conceiving. I shall be percipient in is the perceiving. It means it'll rain down on you. And I shall be non-percipient is con per conceiving, not see it that way. I shall be neither percipient or non-percipient is conceiving. Conceiving, then it gets down to the brass tacks. Conceiving, conceiving it's all about me is a disease. Conceiving is a tumor. Conceiving is a dart. Taking it personally is a dart. By overcoming all the conceivings, the bhikkhu is called a sage of peace. And the sage of peace is not born. He does not age. He does not die. And when we look at this, does it mean his whole life? Are we talking about his life? Or, or can we say this in another way? I, I'm not sure what I said, but I'll tell you in a second. Um, and I'll just keep reading. For there is nothing present in him by which he might be born and not being born, how can he age, not aging? How can he die, not dying? How can he be shaken, not being shaken? Uh, why should he be agitated? So if you're not disturbed about anything, why are you gonna get upset about anything? You won't. So it was with reference to this that it was said, the tides of conceiving do not sweep over him who stands upon these foundations. And when the tides of conceiving no longer sweep upon him, he is called a sage of peace. Now, the tides of conceiving here means that no longer is the sage subject to act through imagination. 
He's not going to keep imagining your magic. He's just going to be where you are, see what's going on, do what's needed. He no longer, he, he does he become lost in expanded concepts and so forth when living means you take things as they actually are. Now the sage sees very clearly what is essential and has, uh, has abandoned any unessential facets in what arises. You know, in the morning on the retreat, you were saying something about it, what is essential and what is unessential. And what it meant was, do you hold on to what is essential? Well, what does it mean? You have something happen to you in the office between you and someone else. Your mind goes immediately to what's unessential, like this must be like what happened last week. So you're not here in the present and nobody can change because you just uh, decided that it's like what happened before, you see? And that's not good because you're not in the present. You're not in, in peace, pursuing peace. You're pursuing repetition of your habits of doing things the same way all the time. So now he's, he only sees, hears, smells, tastes, touches, or thinks clearly knowing this alone is as it is and nothing more. He takes nothing personally anymore. He knows things as they are and thus dismisses the personal perspective. And thus he sees now that it is the consequence of the idea of a self, uh, which has the problem and the taking of things too personally, which causes so much grief and suffering. So once again, when you say self and no self, it doesn't mean the self as you, like your name, like Deepa disappears. It doesn't mean you disappear. It's a consequence of always thinking about I, me, my, mine constantly, you know? And it's a consequence of when you do that, you're taking everything personally and that's what you give up. The consequence. So when you're living with an impersonal perspective, you're living with a clear mind of what's happening now and then next and then next. And your work and your productivity, they really increase well. I used to talk to some companies and banks and things and everybody got all excited about this stuff. So he has abandoned this idea by retraining mind to release automatically any such ideas relaxing any tension or tightness existing in his mind by which the body follows. His arising smile uplifts his mind and sharpens his awareness as he returns to lovingly accept the present moment and send out kind thoughts to his inner world and outer world during whatever task he is doing each day. He continues repeating this entire cycle of escape from suffering, and thus he purifies and retrains his brain repeatedly all the time through daily life. The student attains an experience of various levels of liberation for their mind and supports the growth and endurance of the imperturbable mind. Mind can no longer be shaken by any occurrence at any sense door because of the establishment of knowledge and wisdom of how these things are. You see imperfections immediately and let them go. And an imperfection is when you get the urge to dive in and take everything personally. And then we get to the end of the story. It's pretty self-explanatory. It says, it is here that Pukasati came to know that the master teacher was his, in his presence, and indeed he was teaching, being taught himself by the Buddha Gautama himself. And he understands a mistake that he made earlier in the night by addressing the Buddha as a friend. And when he brings it up and apologizes for it, this cleans away everything from the next moment and offers a fresh canvas for him to keep going. He's just cleaned the gold made the gold absolutely pure, which is his mind. And this is very healthy for all of us to learn to do and is included in the morning of every Buddhist service. And the next part is he set out to get the robes, the next part he's killed by a cow. And so then at the end, uh, now I wanna just explain the cow thing briefly. Uh, because the reality of him being killed by this cow, it wasn't just a stray cow. This cow came after him. And the reason this happened was because in another lifetime, uh, the cow was an ogre. And 
in another lifetime, Hukasadi killed the ogre and destroyed the ogre's family. And in this lifetime, the ogre came back as a cow and he sees Hukasati and he recognizes who he is. So when he's walking down there, this freak of nature where all of a sudden he sees him and takes revenge against him for killing another being. And that's how Kami was killed by the cow. So, um, you know, that's, that's the story about the cow. It seems clear. Okay, so now the other thing is what happened to him uh, the monks come to the Blessed One, they ask him what happened to him, and he explains that he's actually reached the state of Anagami. So let me explain. It seems clear by the statement uh, that the clansman Pukasati, due to his practice and the assistance from the Buddha's clear instructions that night, he attained Anagami, the level of Anagami means the being is now reborn in another realm and will be a non-returner to the earth realm. And a non-returner, the first non-returner is the anagami level, okay? And then Venerable Pukasati retained not only a little bit of craving and clinging, but in this case, any clinging must have been due to the disappointment of getting run over by a cow after making all this effort and finally meeting his master and getting everything so straight in his mind. What a tragedy when you think about this, you know, I mean, just having traveled so far on foot and then this happening. But now he will have another chance with another lifetime in a higher realm to complete himself to the level of arahatship. Then this level of anagami or once returner um, is just below the level of the ar arahatship. And then at the very end, that's the closing of at the end of the sutta. So now I want to go back to you guys and I want to uh, see what's up with all of you and um, take the questions. Any questions from anybody? Let's hope you brought back the questions because you're the ones, went, how do we do this? Oh, I always get lost. <laughs> Let's see. Um, help, I can't get back. <laughs> Um, here we go. There. Hello. Okay. Woo! <laughs> so now it's your turn. You need to ask uh, what kind of questions you have. You can, you can put them on the chat to Dhamma Gavesi or you can just ask about any of this. Uh, but to me, it was really fun because, as I said, short period of time, very compact, very clear teaching, very supportive and pulling together what he already learned and putting it all connected. And then there he goes. Maybe he opens to Anagama level. Mm -hmm. So what do you think? Questions to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Mr. Kema, for section 22, um, it says, if I were to direct this equanimity to the base of infinite space and develop my mind accordingly, this would be condition. What does that really mean, this would be condition? Condition by what? A conditioned state is one where you're creating it and you're you're making it happen, you know? Um, this is steering. Wait a minute. If, if I were to direct the equanimity to right in this thing. Okay. You can... Everything, actually everything that's happening to you before you get to Nibbana is, an, is a conditioned state. And um, when you go into Nibbana, what is a conditioned state? A conditioned state is basically, what's the word I'm hunting for, Bonte? Help me. Uh, the automobile, the concept. concept is involved concept with, uh, uh, with the, um, the idea of conditioned, okay? And conditioned, you're, in, you're controlling somehow. And the more, the, the fact is in the practice, the more that you let go, the more you attain. Now, you have certain things that you do in your practice that are very, very, very subtle. All of the stronger things uh, 
that have to do, for instance, let's do it this way. All the strong things you do on a sailboat are pulling lines and doing really heavy work. But if it's a really nice day and you're sailing in a sailboat, you're just sailing and it's just going along and, and it's moving like this, but you don't have to do a lot of fixing and stuff. You watch the wind and keep it on the right tack, on the right nautical line, and the wind is hitting perfectly. You don't have to, a lot of adjustment and everything, see? Condition. So what is the conditioning that you do in your practice is when you come in and you say to me, I'm using quiet mind as my object of meditation, and this is what's disturbing you say something's disturbing you and it's making you come out so i will say change your object of meditation to quiet mind with tranquility or quiet mind with stillness but these little tiny shading you know of the it's not you don't have to do a lot you are still very 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 still and watching it's you're giving the intention in your mind is I'll be absolutely still and I will be right there. So there's not a lot of conditioning that you do. Everything we do in the world right now is conditioned. You get it? Everything. everything. But in, in Nibbana, there is no condition. It's an unconditioned state. The problem we have, and it's like concepts and no concepts or conditioned states and unconditioned state. All right, that's kind of the same thing. Go ahead, Bhante. Uh, regarding conditioned state? Mm -hmm. See, conditioned state in one of the uh, options uh, uh, where it has been explained is like, uh, if there are uh, anything which requires, uh, it is a combination of two things, which uh, uh, create something like in an atom. So if there is an atom, there is an uh, electron, proton, and, and uh, 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 whatever, uh, there is electron, uh, neutron, and proton, and that makes an atom. So that uh, is a uh, basic function, is that something which has a uh, ability to conjole or make a, 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 a two different parts can make a, another part, is a condition thing. So, so in in relation yeah so in relation to concept and non and no concept the same idea because a concept is something that has parts it's not like this pen this the pen is a concept but we have um, the function inside and how it operates and the point and everything and if I use a normal pen right you have the clicker at the whoops that's not <laughs> that's really funny <laughs> let's see here's one okay here's a pen this is the concept is the pen okay I have a clicker I have a hook for your shirt I have the top and the bottom I can unscrew I have the point of the pen the ball of the pen the ink inside these are the components of this concept I presented and when you're designing a car there is a concept department where they design the concept first and then they do the insides of the car well when we're up now let's take it to the smallest piece we can to identify this is where it's funny our whole entire language English Chinese any any language every single word in the English language is a concept I, I spent about a week trying to find a word in the English language that was not a concept. And I finally got to the articles, <laughs> a, and, and the. And each one has a, a purpose and meaning that connects it to make it into a concept. Shoe, hat, coat, glasses, see? And they have all these parts, you see? And, and this, this is, is uh, that and, even a full stop is a concept. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But they, uh, oh. um, even a full stop is a concept. Yeah. And so we're talking in conditioned language about Buddhism and attempting to teach you about something that is nothing. Oh, I, I think was up uh, here for uh, six weeks trying to heal. And the, the abbot where I was, he gave me one chore, one chore only, the Diamond Sutra. I had to recite the front half of it in the morning and, and, and chant the, and, uh, chanting it in English, but 
reciting it with a, the knocker the whole time, you know, uh, the half, front half in the morning and the other half in the afternoon. And all... Connection issues. Uh, yes, yes, Pante. <laughs> connection issues. Do, uh, can you check uh, uh, the internet connection? Okay, just a minute, I'll check it. Okay. Um, Oops. Okay, is this better? Is that better? Hello? Uh, can you hear? No, but I can hear you. Your visually, uh, the images are breaking. But That's not from me. I, everything's clear at this end. Do you want me to try one no. more? I can try one more. Wait a second. Uh, no, uh, try uh, the local uh, broadband which we have taken. I'll DSMC try that. that I'll try that one just a second. Okay, is that better? Better? No. <laughs> so I don't know. Just, am I clear? Am I am I bad for everybody? Deepa, what is like? Can you hear me? Yeah, it's okay for me. It's okay for a major. How about uh, uh, May? Is it okay for you? Uh. It, it breaks up once in a while. Um, I don't know. I tried three of them, all three of them. So it's, it's does anybody okay. have more question on this? Yeah? So, oh, okay, May, to finish what you were saying, just for a second, this thing about concept and no concept, we live in a concept world and a conditioned world here. And the Nibbana is a state, an unconditioned state. So how do we even talk about it if we are stuck with a language where every single word is a concept? How can we talk about something that is no concept? You see the problem? So, in, so some monks try to attempt to do this. And the book is, once you understand this, what a concept is, and a lot of people don't understand what a concept is. Once you understand what a concept is and you read the book, then no, 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 no. Okay, uh, okay, but then um, what we all seem to agree on in uh, when I was at the university at two different universities in the Buddhist studies department, we all agree you can write a book about what Nibbana is not. <laughs> mm. See, what it is not from based on the text. And so he's telling you very well in this what it is not Nibbana and what is Nibbana by the sage at peace. And the conceiving is making concepts, keep, keep making more of my concepts. That's, um, what does it mean conceiving and non-conceiving? Conceiving ideas. You conceived, a, I conceived a really good idea today and anybody who wants to make money on it should just jump on it right now. <laughs> I found out that the fashion industry got smart and that they also were getting concerned uh, that the children should still be able to smile and laugh with each other and smile and see smiles in life and see smiles on adults and stuff like that. And finally, the fashion community now is starting, just starting to make, to make masks that have a nose on it and a, a, a mouth. 
But I took this concept one step further in a, in a comedy discussion that I was talking with somebody today and I said, they are really missing the boat. Right now they have not gotten there yet. When my children were going to school, okay, my children in kindergarten had a chart and they filled it out every morning and then you checked off what you were for the day. You see, I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm okay, I'm irritated, I'm angry, I don't want to play. There was, and you checked off where you were for that morning when you went to school. That way everybody knew where you were. And she put the chart on the wall and you could change it during the way. It had pe pegs, little pegs. And you could put where you are in the morning and where you are in the afternoon. And it was really fun to play with this in this, in this nursery school, you know, and the kids learned about it. I don't see why we can't make a shoe box with 12 masks in it and sell them to you and say, okay, here's, here's the word. Here is what we're going to do. Monsieur Divac Smaths. This is what this is. Monsieur Divac. Divac is COVID backwards. <laughs> Monsieur Divac masks to assist you in understanding the mood of each person. And you have 12 moods. Let's see, open the box. You put a smile or you put a frown or you put a little bit of, oh, I'm a little bit angry or you put, oh, I'm sad on the mask. And then you let the children tell you who they are. What do you think? <laughs> You see? So really, this is something people could do. Why not? Are you all gone or are you here? Hmm? We are here I'm, the, you know, they're making a lot of money on this with the mask that has the smile now because people were tired of seeing people with a black mask and a gray mask and a green mask. That's just silly. You have all these beautiful people and you, you can get different colors to go with different clothes. Think about this, <laughs> it'll be funny. You know, and um, the people I was talking to, they said, you know, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> so why not let them out? So what else do you think about the sutta? Hmm? Huh? You, how are you doing in England? I think uh, the connection will be a problem. I, 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 I'm here, but I'm not on video. Uh, okay, the, but how, how did you get what was going on with the yeah. sutta? Are you okay? I think, I think the sutta is just a, a, great, uh, a, a great exposition on the whole of the Dharma. So, uh -huh. and, and I think. Um, I, the questions? Uh, the, the way that I think it, uh, it works through. And um, Oops. the options, the options it, it represents are in different know. ways. I don't know if this one's very, very good. Go ahead, yeah. go ahead. I'm going to change again. Yeah, and it, it gives um, so many opportunities for different ways of practice, um, and uh, I think part of the uh, part of the country, and it'd be really helpful. And I'd love to have a copy of what you produce. Um, I think there's an opportunity also that to elaborate on on way um, uh, work with each of these different each of these different facets you work with right f way you work with the element and and uh, how they actually present themselves sometimes in um, in life because uh, uh, you you can have uh, oh thank you uh, Bante. Um, the, the, the these things can combine together. So the emotions can come through as an experience in the body of the elements. The body can feel extremely heavy. It can feel very hard. It can feel soft and fluid. It can. So there's there's many ways to link through the different uh, the different aspects of the of the sutta uh, to actual practical um, a day a day to day uh, practice. And I think that's a a, a fascinating area. Um, and you only see these links because the sutta has got so many different facets uh, coming in one place. So you, view, you see the connection between the different pieces? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Anybody else? Deepa? Yeah. Um, sister, so um, what, what about preferences that we have? Uh, you know, in, in life, we, we, we have certain wishes for ourselves, some dreams, uh, you know, it's about the future and you do look forward to it. So what would be the right relationship to I don't, Okay, I don't want you to get mixed up about the, the, the past and the future. So let's look at this in the right way. We're saying you live in, remember I talk about living in the present time. So you have a daughter and she's ready to go to college and you and your husband want to sit down and talk to her about the next five years and let's make a plan. You're going to sit there in the present time at a table and talk about the plan for the future for five years. There's nothing wrong with that, is there? Okay. But if you, if you are, are um, obsessing with the possibilities of something in the future constantly, and it, the, it's pulling you away from living in the present time. You have to take the truth of the three pieces, okay? The truth of the past, we can pretty much agree on. The events in it, they're past, they're over, they're fixed in time. If a little child came and said, can I change the color or mold it or shape it a different way or make a different outcome, you would say, no, it's in the past. And the energy in it, we can pretty much all agree, the energy in the event in the past is gone. That energy is used up in that event. It's not here now in the present. In the future, when we go to this side, we look at that and we say, okay, what is true about the future uh, what's true about the future is it's not here yet, and we don't know what it is, and we know in because of the level we're looking at, uh, mankind is looking at quantum physics now, we're looking at the potential of the future looks more like this, all these possibilities, we can see all these possibilities when I look out front, it could be any one of them, depending on what I do back here, takes me in the direction of this one or that one it by, by what what I do in the present moment dictates what happens in the future he says and and then he'll say what you think and ponder on becomes the inclination of your mind so what you're thinking here in the present this morning can affect your whole entire day if you don't know how this works okay and you it can be melancholy all day Okay, unless you understand that at, uh, the only place you are alive, this is what's important about this part here. This is the present time. And what is the most important piece of it is that in the dictionary and the encyclopedia and everywhere else in science, this is the only place you are alive. You are not alive in the past. You can't be, right? And you cannot be alive in the future. It's not here yet, right? Okay. So this, this is what I call the balancing lesson. Now, when you ask the question, you ask it in the proper context. The question is not, can we talk about the future? No, of course you can talk about the future. And of course you can talk about your dreams. Of course you can come to me and say, I want to learn to manifest. And I would teach you how to design what you want to have happen and sit and dream with me and write it down and color the house or the dream or the show or the orchestral piece you wanna write or the painting you wanna build. You talk about it and you, you build it in your mind here and you write it on a piece of paper and everything. you fold it up, you put it in a drawer and then you go about your life. You don't change the color of this, don't change the shape of it. If that's really what you want it to be, you'll be surprised what happens. Because if you just, the dreaming uh, is fine, but the dreaming should be placed in the present time on the piece of paper in the drawer, then you go on. Now you work towards that, okay? It, the, the funny story is about when I wanted to buy the tractor and I wanted the tractor, had I planned the tractor, this is my first real serious manifestation. I needed the tractor. And I needed the tractor to have a scoop on the front and I needed it to have a blade on the back and I needed it to have a brush hog that was hooked onto it to manage the property. And then this guy came and he said, I got just the tractor for you. It's a perfect size for you and this place. And I, he sold me a red tractor. Well, my original tractor, just so you understand, was orange. <laughs> 
and I bought the red tractor. Well, every, nothing worked out with the red tractor, and it didn't, it couldn't, it could have a scoop, but it couldn't pull a, a blade, and it was impossible to hook a bush hog to it, a brush hog. So we didn't have, it, we went on for a year like that. And finally I went and I, I went, I'm gonna do this better. I went to the tractor place and I got the brochure for the tractor, the exact size, the exact price, the exact color with all of the implements and this and figured out. And then I folded it up, but then I got another one and I put it on the door at my cootie. I looked at it every night, every day. I were, it was working every day. And I'll be darned if the money didn't arrive and pay for the tractor and the tractor was delivered. See, I know another guy who, who wanted to understand, uh, he, he had things he wanted that he was obsessing about his dreams so much that he could not work. He was a salesman and he wanted, here's what he wanted. He was very clear, it's very funny, but very clear. He wanted to find the, the, um, the right job with upward mobility beyond sales into management of territories. And he wanted to live in Seattle in the Northwest and he wanted to have a giant dog and this woman that was the perfect wife and have this house with like five components, okay? So this, his went on for three years, okay? So the first time he called me back, I said, okay, what's the deal? He says, well, I'm, I've switched my jobs, but I'm stuck in Kansas and I'm dating this woman, but obviously she's not it. I said, get rid of her, get rid of her. You, you need to let her go. She doesn't fit any of the qualifications you told yourself. You write it all down again. Why are you changing? And he said, well, I, okay. All right, so we write it all down again. We fold it up and then he went back to Kansas and he said, he just got a promotion. He wrote me, I'm going to the Northwest. And he ends up with a promotion if he'll go to the Northwest. So he went to the Northwest and it didn't take very long, about half, seven months, the next seven months, got enough uh, for the down payment on uh, the house that he saw that he really liked. And the dog was at the pound. He got that dog from the pound. It was the perfect dog. And then he finds the woman. <laughs> <laughs> and then he calls me, said, my life is perfect. And then he called me about a year ago. I hadn't heard in, from him in years. He says, we got married. We got a child now. We put an addition on that. I'm doing it exactly as you tell me, see? But you don't, you don't, you don't think about it all the time in the present time, you see? You design it, you put it away, and it's in the brain. But be careful because, you know, uh, my excuse is I'm Irish and I believe in the little people. And when you lose something, you always say, it's okay. The little people needed it. <laughs> if I need it, it'll come back to me. And I, I rest that way. I don't get upset if I lose something so much anymore. I just rely on the little people. Well, the little people are there, okay? I, I'm convinced of it. And the problem is I really blew it with the tractor. These little people were working really hard to get the red tractor, their the orange tractor. And then a man shows up with a red tractor and then they found out, you can just hear the discussion. Oh my gosh, what happened? What's wrong, says the supervisor. You can't believe it. You told me to work on her. I was working on her. I was working on the orange tractor and I was hunting for the scoop. I had this all lined up. And my gosh, she accepted a red tractor. What am I going to do? He says, well, you know the rules. You got to throw that all out and start again. You can't change any part of it. I don't want to throw it away. I've been working on it for three months now. What are you telling me? You know the rules. You have to throw it away. Okay, okay, you okay. can. And then they start again. <laughs> and this time, remember, I gave them the brochure. I, when I'm not in the cootie, they can go in there and look at it. <laughs> if they exist. <laughs> Yeah, I put it on a tree in a part where I was working in the woods all the time. I was afraid that they would come around me to find out what I was doing. So I took it with me when I was working in the woods and I tacked it up on a tree. Here it is. I'm working out here. This is what I want. See? Eventually it shows up. I can't explain it. We do it. A lot of things at the center happen that way. <laughs> I don't know what it is. You know? But you only can't. three hours, Sister Gemma. Okay, so anybody else have a question? We got question, question. Come on. 
<laughs> yeah, okay, Effendi, I think, yeah, Effendi? Uh, yes, uh, sister, uh, you, you mentioned about uh, our brain is like a three or three year old child. So, so one you mentioned about the one way to communicate with our 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 brain is through repetition. And what what are the other ways that we communicate with? Should we call should we call it unconscious mind or what? Um. Okay. There, the other way. <laughs> You know, you're putting input of information all the time in your brain. Mm. When I'm talking about it's a three-year-old, that's about the way they beha it behaves sometimes. It's the behavior. But it's not how much knowledge it has and all the operation of it. Of course, it's spectacular. The brain, we can go on and on about how spectacular it is. It can run an electric train. If I wire it up, it has so much electricity. It can run an electric train around the floor. Did you know that? I can do that. But, you know, it's the brain, the only way that you can train it, the, the neuro, neuroscientists are convinced is by through repetition. You know the program with the, the born identity? Anybody know the born identity, the movie? The born identity, yes. yeah? You know he was, uh, he was brainwashed, right? And that's how they brainwashed him. That's what brainwashing is, is like this, see? Until you just do it. But this is a little different because this is, has to do with behavior modification in your mind. And you have a habit of doing something and you want to change a habit inside your mind. I'll show you, I'll show you a picture. Um, inside your mind, um, you know, Inside your mind, okay, uh, your, your head's like this, right? That's pretty good. I'm not going to give up my day job, I promise you. <laughs> okay, little neck. Okay, the point is your brain has all these little tendrils coming out of it. This is what, um, how they explained it to me. Okay, you have all these little tendrils and they're like hairs, you know, like this. Um, Just thousands and thousands and thousands of them, okay? These are neural pathways inside your brain, okay? This is how it works, okay? And um, what I was talking to you about was how do you change a habit? And what we're talking about is communication for the person. They have a neural pathway they found out for the guy, for person who has an anger issue, has a really uh, one that is thick like this, okay? And it's very established because it's some kind of habit that you use all, you do it over and over again. This is what we're talking about. So this one is established. So you wanna change it. And so what you want is instead of this hot looking tendril coming out, you, you want this cool, you do. <laughs> you want this cool um, blue, really nice thin tendril to come out like this and you start loving kindness. And the event, the, what they found out about the brain is that um, they thought these neural pathways were fixed by the time you were adults. And then in science, they found out later um, that these tendril, these um, neural pathways are not fixed totally when it comes to behavioral patterns. 
and that you can change your behavior patterns, your habits of behavior by just not feeding this one anymore. And then if you don't feed it, they kind of shrink, okay? And, um, and they, um, they begin to look like this. They kind of shrink and they sort of get broken like that. Eventually they fall off because you established a new one for that behavior. So this behavioral response instead of an angry reaction. So they're actually showing now, they're doing research and proving that this is how this works. And the repetition part comes from doing the same thing again and again. Now also in the Buddhist sense of things, let's look at something for a minute. In the Buddhist sense of everything, you look at the four steps of right effort and you look how it is designed, how it's spoken about. It's definitively a practice. The sixth fold, the seventh fold, and the eighth fold, and the eighth path have to do specifically with a practice, an ongoing religious practice. And the repetition, not coming from me, it's come from the Buddha. Repetition is part of the practice of change. And it shows up in different sutras. And um, what you're doing when you're doing the four steps of right effort over and over, this is why it's so important not to confuse the brain. So when you're going from a breathing meditation to practicing the Brahma Viharas this way, you have to do the six steps. Uh, I think she got disconnected. Yes. What was working well and what kept breaking down um, for different people in the retreat. And it's, it, it all this had to do with repetition. All of it has to do with repetition. So is the Fendi still here? Can you get back on? Yeah, yes. he's there. Yes. So, okay. So the repetition has to do with doing it enough times the new way so that the old way starves. If you remember the habitual tendencies from the angle of the Samyutta Nikaya, and when we go into the discussion and just look at the, um, the, the title for this thing, you begin to understand. Because the title is on Samyutta Nikaya, page 1597. The title of this is, the Buddha is saying to the monks, I will teach you the nutriment and the denourishment in regard to the five hindrances and the seven factors of enlightenment. Listen to that. And then he gives a lesson for what happens if you give uh, the, uh, the food, which is the personal nutriment for the arising of an unarisen sensual desire? What happens? You're feeding it by paying attention to it. And then we go to the next section of this and we look at the, um, the first one again, um, of the, um, the first one, and, it, and it'll tell you, but if you take it away, then the enlightenment factors can arise. But if you pay attention to the hindrance, then the enlightenment factors can never arise. So when I'm pouncing on you all the time, I'm pouncing on you and continually telling you, and I still haven't written the book. I have all these notes in this one file folder and tr I still haven't put the book together on the on the new the uh the hindrances and just keep collecting what's happening to you in your situations again and again and again and again and again and you're stuck because you won't believe the law and see there are certain laws that have to do with meditation that um exist and these laws we spent i spent uh, a two-hour session once um, down in, in Penang, up on Penang Hill, 
with 17 students and we tried to figure out were there actually laws that govern meditation? Are there actually laws? We were just curious because, you know, we had doctors and scientists mostly and, and, and people who were very innovative engineers in this conference and everybody knew there was laws to physics, laws to mathematics, laws to this, laws to that, laws for operating, laws for everything. Are there any laws that guide you pertaining to meditation? Well, one of the laws that are, is actually absolute is the law of the hindrances. There is a law pertaining to hindrances. And if that's what it's explaining in Samyutta Nikaya. You pay attention to the hindrances when they come up. You are setting yourself up to never have the enlightenment factors arise and come into balance so that you can fall into cessation. It's guaranteed. Not me telling you. If I read that whole sutta to you, they're, they're just telling you absolutely. And there's a whole section on the Bojanga, which is the uh, enlightenment factors. And it's all about this, not just this one discussion. This is magnificent. This one is magnificent because it takes, it takes the mindfulness, the investigation, the energy, the joy, and the tranquility and the collectedness and the concentration. And uh, it does one section for each one. It's about five pages long and it explains if you feed it, then it will, it will keep the enlightenment factors from coming. But if you denourish it, then the enlightenment factor can arise. And so that you're in control in that aspect, you are in control because you make the decision to pay attention to the hindrance or not to pay attention to it. And that's what your, is your free will or your... What is a sutta number uh, it's on, for the nutriment? Um, okay, you go to Samyutta Nikaya, uh, you go to the Bojanga Samyutta, and the number in the Bojanga Samyutta is 51, and then you put in parentheses a one, and that's the one on nutriment, and that one has uh, four, four sections, one, one two, three, um, four, Right, sections. It goes from, from 1597 to the top of 1602. That's how long it is, okay? And what he's really explaining to you in this thing, it, this is like the guts of it. Now, you want the, want the short version, the really short version of what you're supposed to do with a hindrance? <laughs> you go to, um, um, to um, Majima Nikaya number 22, and you go to um, section uh, section 10, I wanna say section 10, I think it's section 10. You go to 22, 22, um, section six, section six. Misguided man, to whom have you ever known me? to teach the Dhamma in that way, meaning, have you ever heard me tell you that you can engage a hindrance? This is the issue, to engage a hindrance or not to engage a hindrance ever. And this monk thought that it was okay to engage a hindrance. And boy, did the Buddha come down on him about this. You misguided man, to whom have you ever heard me say in the Dhamma in that way? Misguided man, have I not stated in many, many ways how obstructive things are obstructions, how they are able to obstruct you who engages in them. Anyone who engages in a hindrance is going to have an obstruction. So you hear us always telling you, go ahead, pay attention to it, feed it some food and help it get bigger and stronger and smarter and stay there longer. And it goes away like a bunny rabbit. It disappears in the bush. And as soon as you put the food out, it comes right out again to eat it. As soon as it comes back and you pay attention to what comes up again, you are feeding it again and again and again. And yet I have retreats where people just won't stop. They just have to keep feeding it and feeding it and feeding it. It's okay. They just don't progress and don't progress and don't progress. But in, in the laws that we came up with, listen to the, listen to the laws. 
you know, the law of karma. What you do, you get back. So you pay attention, it'll pay attention to you. There you go. In the law of Anicca, whatever arises passes away. So why are you concerned about it? If you really understood that characteristic, you want to say, oh, I know what Anicca means. It's impermanent. And impermanence means whatever arises passes away. But do you really understand it? Did you really swallow? Oh, but I know what it means. Sure, you can write the definition. But when you're practicing, do you really understand whatever comes up in your head is going to go away? No, obviously, or you would all be arahats by now. The law of dukkha, suffering, is both mental and physical always it's mental and it's physical these two things are happening okay the mental is connected to the physical you fix the i can stop the pain in my leg i'm not really stopping it i'm putting my full attention right now on my head and my i don't feel my leg i refuse to take the painkillers and stuff but i don't feel it at all because i'm up here see that's the best therapy really when you have an accident and you're under a tree and everybody has to go get help, you can lay there and you can think you're going to die and think of the future and I'm not going to be able to walk and oh my God, if my back is broken, what will happen and who's going to come and what if Bonte's not home when they go down there to get him? What if he's not there and they don't drive back and get me? Oh my gosh, animals could come out of the forest and bite me. There could be snakes. Oh, we could go on and on and on. But I just lay there, you know, watch the pain, <laughs> took all the lessons from the Dhamma hall, watch it go up, watch it go down my spine, watch it arise and be there and pass away. Of course, I was also going unconscious for a while, unconscious and unconscious. And unconscious. But that, that's how I wasn't upset at all. I thought it was kind of funny. I, and the first thing Bhante said to me when he came to help me with the tree, what does he do? Does he rush over there and help me and lift off the tree? No, he comes over and he stands up above me and he looks down like this. He looks down and says, so how's it going? Yeah. <laughs> I said, well, I'm under a tree. <laughs> I'll never forget it. And when I laughed, I said, don't be funny. It hurts to laugh. You know? <laughs> I'll never forget that. Anyway, then you have the law of Atta. Sure, you need to be in there, boss everything around, make it all happen. If you do that, you'll never get to a cessation. The law of Atta, the personal opinion, is what ignites the craving. That is what turns it on. You Listen, this is funny. Hate, distrust, um, uh, jealousy, um, desire. All these words are dead words floating out in the atmosphere until I activate them. I hate, I love, I distrust, I see what's happening. A um, verb is a dead word hanging out no matter how hard I torture. Torture is nothing. Torture is nothing. Unless there's a uh, a word behind it like he, she, they, I, torture. Is that true? The word is active? No, it's not active. So you have a choice to activate it or not. The law of the object, attitude. This means um, come back to nature, the natural state of just witnessing and forget about the object actually being important, whether it is this I'm looking at this or a candle or anything. It's not really important. It doesn't have any information for you. If you ever did that, you know, if thoughts come, to, this is crazy. Why are you doing this? You know, <laughs> you know, um, it's not important. It has no information for you is the point. So this is your, your, inf your knowledge about the object in a meditation, any meditation. The object does not take you anywhere, do anything for you. It's just a recentering point, isn't it? When you're pulled away and when, and you're not pulled away. This is the, this is the famous one. When my mind wanders, see, when you say when your mind wanders, does your mind wander? Can your mind wander? I, I sat there one day with students and said, can your mind actually wander? 
No. I choose like through curate my here I'm I'm focusing on some object. My interest falls down. My um, energy falls down and my curiosity for the object is not there. So if my uh, curiosity moves, I move the attention away. I help mind move it away. I fix it so it'll go away because my interest in my spiritual friend isn't there anymore. So did, do we blame the mind for this or do we take responsibility? It's interesting. And then you have the hindrance, don't feed it. And then you have nutriment, the law of nutriment, how it works throughout. We have that one, the law of mind. The law of mind is really important. Mind, you say it every morning, but do you believe it? Mind is the forerunner of all states, mind made are they. Whether they're wholesome or unwholesome, do you believe it? Do you believe Nama Rupa was discovered? Do you believe that there is actually a connection between the mind and the body from here down? So why would anybody change the instructions and instead of just releasing, then just relaxing and smiling and coming back? Why would they start saying, well, I, I, I was pulled away and I um, released my attention and then I relaxed for a little while, my whole body. I started here and I worked all the way down and when I got to my toes, <laughs> then I smiled and a little bit and then I came back. Why would they change the instructions that way and then get angry because the results are not happening? That's like taking the eggs out of the cake mix and expecting it to work. Can't work, go ahead. This is like, um, go, uh, um, right, right, Kumar, right. Savant Kumar. <laughs> uh, actually, the, the nourishment of uh, hindrance is our attention, right? This is personal kind of, attention. That's right. That's I right. Think this is this is kind of a core of uh, our meditation practice. Like before before the mistake I used to do was I was actually focusing okay. onto the. Like when I, when I was practicing before, uh, before that film, I was, the mistake yeah. I was doing was this one. This is like, when the hindrance was there, I was focusing into the pain and seeing what is, what this pain was. Right. In that, exactly. I, I can, I can clearly find the difference after I apply the six hours and not keeping attention over there. That's right. It's, it's disappearing. It's disappearing by itself. Yes. This is, uh, I feel like this is kind of... Uh, it's, uh, I haven't been able to really discover um, what the source is for the change in the instructions, where they even came from. They're not in the text anywhere. We checked with some people who were working with the text and we, uh, I mean, some, you know, like um, the Vamses and the people who have the text completely memorized, they can tell us it's not in the Tipitaka any place that you should concentrate on your pain. That's not there. And the other one is to pay attention to an object, to focus on an object as the core structure for your meditation is not what the Buddha was doing. It's what he was doing before he was awakened, but at the point where he was awakened, he then decides to teach what happened to him, what helped him to go through to Nibbana. And that was different from before. So we believe that Samadhi, the Samadhi word, uh, Rice Davies, uh, he talked about it. The Sama um, is the serenity, serenity source, and plus the D is the wis wisdom, a source word for wisdom in Pali. And we believe Rice Davies is right because he did research. He's the he's the one word on all the language, the biggest word on it. And in his dictionary, he makes a remark when it's in, it's, in the, it's in the notes. And he explains this whole thing very well. He says that in the time of the Buddha, uh, ekagata, meant, um, ekagata meant concentration. That was the word for it, okay? 
and that they didn't need another word. That was the word. And when he started teaching, he started using samadhi. So this idea that samadhi means concentration is a modern invention. And he points out, he feels that when the Buddha went through and discovered something new, he named it. And the samadhi practice was different. He took that word and he put those two sources together, samadhi, samadhi. So this is why your training is called tranquil wisdom. The tranquil from the standing, tranquil wisdom, insight, meditation, twim. That's why it's called that. You see? I feel like. So, the, yeah. I feel yeah. like uh, the, this, this instruction, uh, not focusing attention on the distraction, even Bhante is pretty much in every, every discourse, he says this one. And this is kind of, I feel, meditation 101. Means it should be the first, first things to be taught. And that's where we're giving it to you from the very beginning. We try to make you understand this. But the habitual tendency is there. It is ingrained and mm -hmm. habitual. And the idea, <clears throat> you know, one big, uh, one teacher, I guess it was in Singapore or Hong Kong. I can't remember. I went to him to discuss this and uh, about the hindrance thing. And... <clears throat> He told me the reason that this is, this was his explanation. And you know, it's not like it was in the text. He didn't say it was in the text. But the reason for this is we really want you to understand a Nietzsche. Therefore, we are gonna tell you to go into the pain and sit with it until it goes away. But you see, the problem with this is, you know, I said to Monty when I heard this, I went back to him and I said, you know, I've been thinking about that. I'm kind of slow. <laughs> And I said, if I were to do that, I would do that so many times in my meditation, maybe not that many, but it would come like that. And I'd be watching you do that way. But we're watching, we're giving you another lens on the microscope. At one level, maybe that's what you want to do to see it. It's a good idea to see it that way. But when we put the next lens on the microscope, you go much deeper. Now you're going to see thoughts arising and passing away. You're going to see the little tiny lights come and arise, be, not be there, arise, be there, and pass away. You're going to see the levels in the states. So you're in this much higher level looking at things simply because you have a more powerful lens and you're paying attention to the laws of how this is all working. And you're discovering that we can't find this we can only teach, we're only allowed to teach you if we can back it up in the text. That's what, how I was brought up, you know? We try to take it back to show you the verification for it. Yeah? You got any other questions? Anybody? Uh, you I come, come tomorrow. Okay, come tomorrow night. It's just going to be the retreat people tomorrow night, okay? Okay? Yeah? Okay. okay. I think uh, we are already more than three hours. We should end it now. Yeah, we are in the three hour mark here, folks. Okay. Yeah, three hour so fifteen minutes. Both, uh, do you know how many how long it was for the talk itself without the questions? I think it was more than about uh, about two hours or something like that. It may have been two about two hours. Okay. So uh, we need hours. to cut it. We have to cut it and not put the questions up when we do this, okay? Can you do that? Yeah. Okay. 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 So we, we'll sign off now and say the prayer. And then okay. tomorrow, if you were in the retreat, come back at 30. We'll only be the retreat people. And I'm going to spend some time tomorrow fishing out the questions in your reports. Because of my leg, I was not able to keep going to the retreat, um, you know, sitting up and, and, um, working at the computer because the antibiotics are affecting my eyes as well as uh, it was a good test i thought about putting blinders on to see if i could learn dhamma and be blind <laughs> you know but i can't see and read right now very well and i have to after we're finished tomorrow i have to stay in bed for a few days to get this really better okay so let's say a prayer okay May suffering, suffering ones and be suffering free and the fear struck fearlessly. fearlessly. May the grieving shed all grief. 
May all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting peace and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they, May they long protect the Buddha's the dispensation. dispensation. Sadhu. Sadhu.